check, check. All right. All right, if I can have your attention, please, we can start making our way back to our seats. If you're out in the lobby and you can hear me, doors are about to close and you're going to catch your fingers in it. Just keep her. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, before we bring these guys up, I just want to say thanks again for being here. What a uh, great event this has turned out to be, and I just want to say thanks to uh, the facilities here. I think it's great that we're bringing people out of this matrix, and I said this earlier, but i got to say it again. I just I can't even believe that I'm at Fantasyland. So, and I've been living in it the whole time. All right. Uh, this... Uh, portion of this wonderful event is, uh, I'll let you guys all get settled in here. It's called Flat Earth and the Bible. And that seems to be a, a hot topic that a lot of people are jumping on in the media right now is, oh golly, these crazy religious folks. Yet it takes five minutes to school somebody from the media with just a little bit of patience and an open mind and a humble heart. So don't treat anybody from the media bad. Please don't. As much as you might want to, don't. Because we're all there. We're all there, and that's the whole thing. And we can have fun with Flat Earth. Ask the guys from the radio station. Did you guys have fun a little bit ago? There you go. They got to meet Roland Reddy. So, uh, all right, so without further ado, let's bring these guys out. Everybody settled in? I'll make it, well, there's one more guy. You're holding us up, pal. You and your hot coffee. Be careful. It's dark over there. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Robbie Davidson out, Emmanuel Lakanga, Rob Skiba, and of course, Matt Long. All right, this is Flat Earth and the Bible panel. And this obviously, when it comes down to this Q&A, we're going to have some discussions and later on we're going to open it up uh, to you to kind of go further in. But I thought it was interesting and amazing that we've got complete different stories here. And I thought I would start by going into, you know, with Rob Skiba, you know, he shared much of his journey and, you know, how he came to Flat Earth. But what I would say, Rob, is, is what's, what's intriguing about all three of you, myself included, is we were Christians before we came to Flat Earth. Now, there's a lot of people now that are becoming Christian after they came to Flat Earth, and that's a whole other matter. But what is interesting is we are all in the same page when it comes to already doing ministry and doing things when it came to, uh, you know, uh, Christian walks. But how would you say things change? And I'm not talking about, like, how it was more about with your relationship when it came to the Creator. Can maybe go into detail on what that pivotal, not the change about, you know, what happened on the outside, the attacks, all, we've gone through that, I think people will recognize that, but what really changed in your relationship with God? Wow, uh, there's so much I could say on that regard, but I would say probably the biggest thing is looking at the scriptures, and I, like I said in my last presentation, dealing with the firmament, uh, I can't, couldn't get around that, I mean, that was a pretty big issue, but Realizing that if that cosmology is true, then he is way closer <laughs> and way more tangible. He is, he's a tangible entity, very close. When I believed in the spinning heliocentric globular Earth f f hurling through space, w where's God? W scripture's telling me over and over and over again, he's right above the firmament. How tall is the firmament? How high? I don't know. But it's a lot closer. <laughs> so he became, I guess, the best way to say it is much more tangibly real. Uh, and closer. And I, and I felt the same way. To me, it was almost like, even though, you know, we knew that God was omnipresent and omniscient, we understood this, it just seemed like, but where are you? How far, you know, like we were talking endless galaxies, and to me, it just brought so, everything so much closer. Because I think that even, you know, for a lot of Christians, I still think there's kind of, God's really far away. Even though, you know, we understand that, there's just this push, a push and push as we get all this, you know, nonstop, you know, multi-galaxies the stuff that you know you covered, so I would say that I you know feel the same way on that. So we're gonna go next to uh, Emmanuel Lakonga and a little bit about Emmanuel. Um, it was an interesting story, but it was uh, Patricia was sharing a video. I think it was in 2015, and um, 
He said, hey, new flat earther, because he had done some flat earth video, and, uh, you know, go support him, because Patricia Steer, uh, you know, Mark Sargent, many people in this community, they're very supportive, you know, and they do a lot of things behind the scenes as well in just encouraging others. And she said, check out this Controversy 7 guy. So I went to the video, and I'm watching. And what was unique, kind of maybe like Mark Sargent, this guy, you know, puts his phone number on his videos. And I looked at the number, and I said, whoa, wait a minute, that's my number. No, 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 it's two numbers off. Wait a minute. He lives in my city, or he's really close. So I call him up. He answers the phone. And I said, hey, man. He said, hey, where do you live? He goes, Canada. I'm like, I know Canada. Where do you live, right? So he went on to say, and we kind of had a good laugh on it. But, you know, when I looked at him, I mean, he was on YouTube for six, seven years. I mean, he was, you know, a very big channel at the time. And all of a sudden, he's coming out with it, and he's like, in my city. So for me, really, when it came to what was my, who was my first real flat earther that I got to meet, it was Emmanuel Lakonga. And we, you know, really hit it off. I remember when we went to Boston Pizza and we sat there and we talked and I'm just this little guy and I'm like, whoa, like you're like, you know, I forget, 60,000 subs. And I mean, I'm looking at his videos and he's got videos in the two, three, four billion. I mean, he can tell the stories on that. But it, to me, it was absolutely incredible that here you are and all of a sudden there was this just completely relationship that formed. And all of a sudden now we're doing a show together, you know, controversial truth and we put out a couple episodes on that you know I was able to be at your wedding you know you just recently got married which was really exciting so um, I just wanted to explain that because I think a lot of people really don't know the connection you know with Emmanuel and myself and uh, you know I'm gonna let him share a little bit more about kind of his journey um, you know basically on YouTube but also into the topic that basically shocked a lot of people when he came up with it yeah uh, oh, can you, is the microphone on? Oops, I guess uh, technical difficulties. But uh, yeah, I, my story was, uh, was actually a very interesting one because I was on YouTube doing things more, I was speaking more, I was doing more exposés and talking about things on YouTube that basically exposes the, in the industry and also, you know, focusing on biblical prophecies and prophetic events. And uh, on my news feed, I began to see things that suggestions that were popping up, and I was I saw the headlines of uh, flat Earth and and all this, and it was back in 2015. So when I first hit, heard of these things, it became uh, almost like a nuisance for me because I I just kind of brushed it, and the more I brushed it, the more I kept seeing more suggestions were still popping up, and I tried to fight it. I was like, what's going on with these people? I'm like, and then and then and then there's First, I knew I knew there was a, a talk of uh, of like you know there's people who believed in uh, in hollow earth in the whole hollow earth theory all of that so I basically kind of brushed that up I'm like this is just nonsense it, now it says flat they're saying the earth is flat and the first thing I said was probably the most same thing that most people maybe have said was we got pictures right we got pictures that's the first thing that I said mm -hmm. But then, uh, then when I basically kept seeing these suggestions popping up, I even saw a Facebook feed that even was talking about best evidence that, we, that, that Earth is flat and all this stuff. And, and, and then I was like, basically, I, I got really frustrated looking at this. I'm like, who in their right minds believe that, you know, the Earth is flat in 2015? So then I basically then began to say, okay, you know what? I think this will be a good topic for me to expose and publish on my channel, debunking flat Earth. <laughs> And that's it. And I basically said to myself, I'm like, Psh, I got the globe. Like, I, 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 we, we know we got pictures. We got the best evidence. We got the international swim, the, the ISS, which now I call the international swimming, swimming station. Um, but <laughs> some of you do your researches, you'll be able to understand what this means. But uh, basically then when I went to try and debunk flat earth, the more I, uh, I, I didn't go with it, in it with the mindset of, I'm going, I, I hate that group, but I went with their, with their perspective of let me give them a, a fair chance because the, the evidence is overwhelming for the globe. So then when I went to go and debunk it, that's when I realized that rabbit hole is actually much deeper than it looks. <laughs> and from there on, it basically was, uh, you know, one, one thing led to another and I, ha I began to have sleepless nights and I mentioned that to you. I couldn't sleep. I wrestled with it. Um, you know, no curvature, you couldn't find it. People sending high altitude balloons, they, they're pointing from one skyline to another, doing mathematics. 
And I, it, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. And then it got to the point where I began to then ask myself the question, well, what does the Bible, th what does the Bible say about it? You know? And then when I began to then look at the perspective of all these scriptural verses, then I began to realize, wow, the Bible is actually a flat earth book. It doesn't say anything about a heliocentric uh, globe. Because uh, when you look at this, at Genesis, the sun was created on the fourth day. And if it was created on the fourth day, what was the earth revolving ar around before the sun was made? I began to ask those kinds of questions. And then I began to then bring this to my sister. I'm like, hey, did you know that the Bible actually says the earth is flat? And my sister said, well, if the Bible says it, I believe it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're, you're not listening. That was my wife. My wife did the same thing. My yeah. wife did. You're like, no, you understand. I just said flat earth. And she's I, like, yeah, the Bible says her, it. Yeah. What kind I, of faith is that? I mean, I wish I had that type of faith. That's exactly it. She said, well, if the Bible says it, I believe it. I'm like, no, 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 you're not listening. <laughs> the Bible actually says the earth is flat. And she said, no, well, I believe it if the Bible says it. I'm like, you're not getting it. I'm telling you. Did you explain to her we're on a ball? I, didn't, like, I explained. Maybe she didn't know that. She believed, well, she knew about the whole, that we lived in a ball and everything. But then when I mentioned to her that the Bible said it, it's like instantly she just said, well, if the Bible says it, I believe it. And I'm like, I couldn't understand why she believed it. And she didn't even see an evidence, you know. But then, I, then when I began to show her the evidence and I basically began to show her what I was uncovering, then she said it makes sense and she believed it without like much hesitation. And then that's when I, uh, I had to make the decision. Well, at this point, um, you know, now I know that uh, if we never m made it to the moon, we never, had in, we never went high enough to take pictures of the earth itself. We have no, we have no pictures and all the pictures, I, I went and actually Googled um, pictures of earth from space. None, none, none so ever that were consistent. They're all different, you know. So, and that's where, you know, I, that's, you, you have to make the decision ultimately, well, if I cross this boundary of going to talk about the earth being flat, number one rule, this is not, you're not doing this to get fame. You're not doing this to gain any friends. You, once you go and you say the earth is flat or you believe that the earth is stationary, you're losing friends. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared to also be persecuted even by people in your own church. And that's what I had to make the decision. As soon as I did that, I lost, peop I lost people, you know? It's a sacrifice, but I, I, hopefully it will pay off that, you know, this truth will go out into the four corners of the earth. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Next, we've got Matt Long, and uh, I was able to meet Matt Long um, in Texas for the first time. And I'll tell you, it's one thing that I keep on saying. I mean, in a very, very short time, he's been able to do remarkable things. And it's, uh, it's a real honor to know you and, and uh, just to be part of, of your journey. But getting into that, when, when I asked Rob the connection and what it kind of did, what was it like for you as far as your relationship was got? Well, I do a lot more YouTube videos now than I did before, but uh, I just want to say, I think it's incredible that you failed your way to 150,000 subs because you were trying to debunk it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, the difference for me has been being in the Word more, and if I can take that portion of Genesis literally, man, what else in, in there can I, can I take literally? And I've, I've spoken to some people about this, but I was, I had an experience when I was in seventh grade where I, I know I was physically touched by Christ, like touched me on the back. And yet in my twenties, I had a period of time where I claimed to be an atheist, like I denied God. And the only difference between then and now is I'm in the word a lot more now. And so it's amazing that someone who literally, who thinks he was literally physically touched by God while not being in the word, being in science books and things like that can be totally different. Sure. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say the, the amount of time spent in the word and, and the awesome. value that it brings. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to Emmanuel because he didn't have an opportunity to really maybe share your journey, you know, getting to the point of being Christian. What were you like before? And I don't think anyone's really, you know, heard your journey when it comes to just your testimony, you know, kind of summing it up. Yeah. Um, on a spiritual scale, I had to ask myself the question. Because remember, it ties in with um, 
what before going in and actually going to speak about this and actually claiming um, you know that our existence actually fits that of the scriptures um, it, it what it did for me was I asked the question well if this is true that the earth is a stationary motionless uh, flat plane then what it ultimately means is that we have a God who has not abandoned us that's ultimately that's ultimately what it means and at the same time it also means that the Bible and I mentioned this on the very first video that I published about flat earth I said that the Bible has basically been proven to stand the test of time and it passes the test that is a that is a strong testimony and ultimately um, this actually ended up making me see God now in a whole different perspective because now I know that our Creator, He is actually close to us. And when the, there's a passage, uh, I don't remember what, where the passage is, but it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows even how much hair we have. He knows everything. All of, he knows us when we're in the womb, before we were even born. He knew, our, he, he knew who we, we would be. He knows our, 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 our future. All of these things, when I began to look at them, it began to actually like, help me in such a way that I became, my relationship with, with God became even more stronger because now I knew for a fact that God, He, is, he, he really made us special in such a way that we not, we not only are made in His, in his own image, but if you look at the things from, a, from the biblical perspective really, his throne is above us. Mm -hmm. Amen. How far we don't know, but He has not forsaken us. We are not a speck of dust, um, you know, that basically is is hurtling in in infinite space and uh, you know spinning in every direction, falling in every direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, He is a God that actually makes sense. And it's a great point when you talk about you know He's right up. If you actually think about it, no matter how technologically advanced we get, up is still up. Exactly. It wouldn't fool anyone. Everyone would understand that from the beginning of creation to wherever it goes. Up is up. Down is down. It never changes. It doesn't evolve. So to me, I think it's a very strong point when it comes to directional studies, when it comes to the Bible, because there is so much to do with up and down and directions. And again, getting to the point of distorting the true creator of creation is even warping the idea of even understanding, well, where's up anymore? It's unbelievable, Matt. Yeah, and I just say it's, it's a lot easier to go down than it is to go up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, in that regard, I, you talk to most Christians, and they would, a lot of them would say, "Hell is beneath our feet, somewhere below us," but yet deny that heaven is just as local above us. Like, that was a big thing for me. I was yeah. like, you, "You will, you will agree that locality of of hell is right below us, literally, mm -hmm. and deny that heaven is." equally right above us. Kind of like six literal days, but know the sun, moon, and stars, that couldn't be literal. Or inside the firmament. There you go. Uh, or that all the stars are going to fall to yeah. earth. And we're going to talk more about that. We're going to definitely get, get into that. We're going to talk a lot more about why they're picking and choosing what's literal and now what's allegory, because uh, there's some interesting things. Um, I think what's really incredible when it comes to biblical cosmology, there's always that one verse, that one verse that was just absolutely profound. God just spoke to you through that verse. And for me, it was Amos 9, 6. And again, in, 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 when it came down to my story that I told at the beginning of the conference, that was really interesting because at Grace Life Church, they use, I believe, the NSAB. And it's the one that says vaulted dome. It doesn't just say dome. It, doesn't, it is the translation that, I mean, punches it twice. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm still waiting, Pastor James, for you to finally interpret that for me, because I asked you five or six times, and you said you were busy, and I'm like, this is one verse, we're like hanging out, you know, like, I mean, you've got a lot of time for a lot of things, but I think it's a real problematic thing, because they have to either say, well, wait a minute, well, maybe that was an error where maybe we kind of went off on it, but then all of a sudden, what's really interesting is you take the Grace Life app on the Apple Store, and change it to KJV, go down to the verse where it says troop. You tap it, you get four definitions. You get one that's ridiculous, has no bearing whatsoever. You're talking about like heaven, you know, men surrounding things, and then, you know, like again, he's talking about creation, and we can get into that. But I just laughed because it's just like ridiculous, 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 firmament. 
the dome to the earth. Hmm. Was it a bunch of men that he's talking about surrounding a thing? Is it a hyssop of like, I mean, it's so ridiculous because it's a creation verse talking about up earth and the water. Give me a break. But they would rather choose anything rather than that last one. It's so horrifying, that dome vault firmament. And again, we were all suckered in. And it's a very interesting study. How, how many times did we look at Genesis? We went right by that firmament, canopies, whatever. But we just, oh yeah, yeah, must be that. Like, we just wouldn't stop. We just, we had to say it had to be that, that's the most logical reason. But like, what I found interesting is you talk about, um, you know, Hoven getting into the canopy theory. But here's an interesting thing. You know, when it gets into, you know, Christian or even doctrine or theology for that matter, lots of different interpretations. How many were there for the firmament. Isn't it interesting? We stopped at one. I mean, heck, we come up with a million different interpretations all over the place, but they only really have one. I don't know of many that they really structurally had a model when it came to the firmament. I'm not talking about the truth of like what it is, but I'm saying, oh, it's an ice canopy or whatever. There wasn't really a lot. But yeah, for me, it was Amos 9 6, and it was particularly interesting because like I was at the church with the translation at the time. You know, and I'm not, I'm not an ultimate, you know, King James version only. I believe it's the best, but I do believe there's other versions out there. Um, so, but for me, I was like, wow. I mean, I would love to hear how this, you know, the interpretation of this. So, Rob, maybe you can explain kind of what that verse was for you, you know, and why, and maybe go a little deeper on that. Well, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Amos 9, 6, because that ties into mine. Mine, as I mentioned in my presentation, was the firmament. I mean, you're just, you're not very far in Genesis 1, and you're, you're confronted with this thing, the firmament. And I grew up in a King James only environment. I am not King James only. I study King James, but uh, I'm a big advocate for parallel study Bibles where you have multiple versions you can compare and have a concordance where you can look at the Hebrew and Greek. And so I would see lots of other translations. Many of them would say firmament. Uh, some are now saying expanse. And so I start looking into that, and of course you got the Danny Faulkners and the others that wanted to say that the expanse is just air and gas and blah, blah, blah. But like I said in my presentation, the, the word doesn't support that. It's a hard, firm structure backed up by internal witnesses telling you the sky is firm. <laughs> you know? uh, so that was a huge one for me. And like I said in my presentation, you know, Kent Hovind, Carl Baugh, I subscribed to the canopy theory until you look down where it says he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament, not outside and around it. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a game changer right there. And then when I got to Amos 9, 6, and King James says, troop. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason it does, and if you do look up those definitions, the, the word's used like three or four times, something like that, in the Bible. And it basically, the word means like knit together, tightly bundled together. That's why like a, a bunch of hyssop or something, or, or, or a troop. I was in C troop versus a 110th air cab when I was in the army. So that's a tight knit group of people. So, yes, you could use that word, but the context, as you said, is all about heaven and the structure of heaven. And after having Zen Garcia on my show, because apparently that verse drew his attention, and uh, he went into it and started showing me why the NASB and some others talk about dome or vault or vaulted dome, like the double whammy. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, wow, I mean, that's the slam dunk verse right there saying that this thing is actually attached to the earth. That's why the word is used. And so if there's a dome and it's hard and it's attached to the earth, then everything is way smaller. And then when I look at verses like all the stars are going to fall from heaven, well, at that point, I have to look. Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John all said all the stars are going to fall. Somebody's lying. <laughs> and I'm not prepared to say that it's Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, or John. So Carl Sagan's out. Neil deGrasse is out. <laughs> Those guys are out. Uh, sorry, Star Trek, George Lucas, and Gene Roddenberry, you know. Um, <laughs> I can't go there. No, no. Sure. So it, it would be the firmament verses. Awesome. What about you, Emmanuel? What would be that, that one verse and why? For me, the one verse, if I could just check, show this for everybody, it's that one verse that actually drove many people away from the church to be. It's because I've been confronted by people who actually told me, because the Bible says this, I don't buy it, I don't believe in the Bible, I'm out from the church. And it's Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. 
right? This is clearly telling us that the, that the sun and the moon and the stars are the ones that basically revolve around the earth. And also it ties in with also the book of in Psalms 19, um, where it talks about the circuit of the sun, like the, the path of the sun is a circuit. And, the, and then in another passage as well, it talks about the circuit of the stars, the heavens. It's all describing one com the one common denominator is the earth is not the one that's moving. In fact, the Bible does actually touch into that in other Bible verses that it says the earth has been, has been established that it, should not, that it shall not move. So when, you, when I looked into these passages, that's when I realized, like Rob Skiba just said, somebody's lying. So then that's why you have to make the decision. Well, okay, if you believe that the, that the Word of God is divine inspired, that means that it's, it's perfect in, in its entirety. Yet, if you look at the cosmology of, the, of, of, of what we've been given, compare that with the Bible, they do not match up. Nothing adds up. Somebody is lying. So, is it the Lord our God? Because it is, it is his, the Holy Spirit of God inspired men, of, holy men, so that they can write these words. So if you believe that this, these, are, these words are written by God, then you have to decide whether he is lying or whether it's the, the, these, these are modern day scientists who are lying to you. Who? Yeah, and it's interesting, it's interesting how, you know, I've heard uh, interpretations where they say, well, listen, and we get into the doctrine of accommodation, um, but, uh, you know, they'll say, based on their perspective, the way it appeared, what was really happening was that the earth, you know, slowed down and came to a standstill, right? They'll go that direction, but to them, it, it seemed that this was ha taking place. Only problem was, if that happens, the moon's still going. We got major problems if the earth just stopped, period. But then you got problems when it's going in reverse. I mean, we got all sorts of problems every which way. But, I mean, it's a very strong illustration that even if that were the case, and you're going to take that position and come at us with that, what are you going to do with the moon? Because even if the earth stops, that moon's still moving, right? So, again, you have a problem any which way. So, you know, come to the text honest, because I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, say, oh, it must be this, and that. It was their perspective, and it's like, you got problems either way, right? It, take it literal for what happened. And not to mention, they stopped over distinct places. For, I mean, it's a double whammy. When I see double whammies in Scripture, I'm like, it's like, how many times does he have to just be like, oh, when are you going to get it? Do, how many times do I have to say this? So I find it incredibly interesting. But what do we... Yeah, yeah. It even gets worse with, with the Hezekiah situation, because yeah. the sun goes backwards, backwards. 10 degrees. Backwards. So... That would mean, in standard cosmology, that the Earth stopped rotating, rotated backwards 10 degrees, and then spun back up to 1,000 miles an hour again. <laughs> yeah. But they would rather go almost that way than just be like, maybe the Earth doesn't move. Like, unbelievable the amount of indoctrination and just clinging to science, and we'll get into this more, but yet they'll fight science in so many areas. You know, so people can say what they want about us, but at least we're trying to be consistent right across the board. How can you say you're a church that you're going against a lot of, you know, indoctrination when it comes to science, but yet you love science all over here, you know, again, so, I mean, we're just looking at it saying, look, the deception is a lot greater than just the biological sciences, but Matt, what, you know, what, what was the verse that really did it for you and why? Well, like Rob said, in the firmament was, was a big one for me, but also Isaiah uh, 40, 22, where it talks about the circle of the earth and how Isaiah just so happens in chapter 22, I think 22, 18, uses the Hebrew word for ball when talking about being tossed like a ball. And he could have said, tossed like a rock, tossed like a stone. He could have used any word, but he used the word ball almost as if to give us a clue that when he uses the word circle in 4022, um, uh, there's, there's a difference. Like, uh, like Rob Skiva said, uh, Google helps, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, I mean, there might be some people listening and in here and they're kind of curious tonight, Rob. Maybe just give a just condensed version of, you know, a presentation on the difference between a ball and a circle. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be you. amazed at what you, you see. you got a phone, right? <laughs> yeah. Google it and you'll see the difference quickly. And just to elaborate a little bit on like the accommodation thing where it's talking about these guys were writing during a time of what they understood. Well, what does it mean when they said, and then God said? Like, that's a problem, right? <laughs> when God said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's it. I don't really have an explanation for that. And remember, uh, I, don't, I don't remember that verse 100% uh, how it went, but uh, 
he was talking about how he encompassed mm -hmm. um he he made he and he made a he made a yes a, a compass. inscribed a circle yes he inscribed yes he inscribed a it, and I'm using the I'm, I'm, I'm speaking through the King James from the King James version. It right. describe the circle in the face of the deep. Yes. You're about that verse. Yeah. How do you do that with a ball? So and that's the thing. Like to encompass is to to inscribe a a circle. So that definitely, when you look at that there, the Bible writers of the time, if we just if we were to just say okay, if we were to say no, they were writing, uh, you know, um, they when they when they were when they wrote. Um, to uh, a circle it means a ball you know you can see you should be able to see also a, ref a reflection of the ball cosmology throughout the other civilizations as well and other religions but what you see is a common factor and that is the earth is is either circular and there is a there's some type of a boundary at some type of a, 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 a shielding on top of it and even when you go to look at Egypt, the Egyptians, um, they even have those, uh, those um, I, I don't remember which, which deities they are that basically kind the of... sky come. god, not... That's it. an Egyptian. That's it. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. And again, for me, I look at it like kind of the, the, the flood account. Because you see a consistency. There's different various stories. I mean, there was a source, and then there's, you know, these discrepancies. But again, there's a consistent story. There was a worldwide flood. There was a family. You know, numbers, you know, vary. But again, there's a consistent story. So, I mean, that's a really good point you brought up. And the fact that if you follow everyone else, you're right. There is no ball cosmologies. Well, and the interesting thing about talking about inscribing a circle on the face of the deep, there's another area, I can't remember if it's Job or Isaiah, but it talks about the face of the deep being frozen. And you can absolutely inscribe a circle on something that's frozen. And, you know, everyone talks about the puddle, right? And then kind of melt it out with, with the sun. But um, that was one that bothered me for a little bit. But then when I went and saw it, I was like, man, that's crazy. And to think that the edges are potentially still frozen and, and that that's the face of the deep is, is pretty crazy. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, it's just absolutely an incredible thing. I mean, but again, we've, we've all been in this flat earth for, you know, good like three, two years. But again, when it comes to this last year, there's been an incredible surge, I would say, of... Uh, Theologians gone wild, as Rob Skiba likes to put it. And again, I think it's a great illustration because what is going on? And I think this is a good time to talk about um, just what's going on in so many areas. I mean, we're seeing it. They all, at first, you know, when we got into this, we saw this. But it seems that there's a conceited effort of just going off the rails with this. And again, it was almost like the media attention coming in for like 20 minutes. And they're like, we got a rare story. We got enough. It's like you didn't get anything. But it's like... The same kind of reaction is like, you know, the anger is building and stuff. It's like, what is it? You know, I get it all the time. It's like, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. And what is this going on? Don't at least admit this is a big deal. So, I mean, Rob coined the, fa the phrase when it came to theologians gone wild. I think you're on uh, series three. You got part three. You're part four. So watch the whole series because it escalates. It gets crazier. So what do you think? What do you honestly think's going on? You know, let's tie it all around. You know, cosmology, flat Earth, literal. You know, Mandela effect. If you want to go there. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So I start talking about this stuff, and you know I'm just uh, just a dude reading books, right? I'm I'm just out there making videos, uh, and people start watching them. And what happened for me, like I mentioned earlier, I was already on the public scene, doing a lot of traveling the world, talking about talking about other subjects. Um, and so when I started talking about flat Earth, you know, most of my audience, and I had a pretty good sized audience, were like, dude went crazy. <laughs> he's like, he's out. You know, something happened to him. Um, and then they, but they kind of kept an eye on me. They're like watching what's going on, and they're seeing that I'm getting the snot kicked out of me every day. Somebody's just going after me. And after a year, I wasn't backing down. In fact, I was continuing. So what happened with a lot of my audience is they saw the abuse that I was taking and that I wasn't backing down, and they said, well, maybe there's something to this. So then they started, and I started getting apology letters. <laughs> people, people sending me, you know, dude, I like really said the bad stuff. I got to apologize to you. I, you know, I finally took a chance to look at it, and that's all I was saying to people is like, look, just take one day, 24 hours, you know, a 24-hour time period, and look into it. That's all. And people started to do it. So what I saw starting to happen, and what I think is happening even more these days, is it is it's the, the lay people, the people in the congregations 
that are watching the YouTube videos, that are looking the things up for themselves, they're opening their Bible up for themselves, they're, they're doing some of the tests, they're buying the P900 camera, uh, they're doing these things for themselves. And so what's happening is a lot of these churches are being filled <laughs> slowly with flat earthers, being people converting mm -hmm. into flat earth, and they're challenging their pastor. They're saying, yeah, dude, you're telling us we're supposed to believe the Bible, but how come you're not believing the Bible? And it's gotten to the point now where I know some, some churches are probably coming up on 50% flat earthers, and it's causing problems. So these guys are, are basically saying, we've got to shut the, these guys up. So all of a sudden, in the last year, I started seeing more and more creation ministries uh, trying to take a stand against this, and the outrageous things that they do to try to say, well, this is what the Bible says, but it doesn't really say that. You know, it, Actually, that's what the devil starts out with in the serpent in the garden. Hath God really said? <laughs> Did God really say that? You know, And I'm seeing these pastors, I'm seeing these creation ministry guys do these unbelievable tap dances and mental gymnastics with the text. And I'm like, guys, what are you doing? And I think right now they're just trying desperately to save face. It's a pride issue, frankly. It's a money issue. Uh, these churches are afraid that they're going to lose you know, congregation members and they'll lose money, so they don't want to take a stand. It's these ministries that have been entrenched with canopy theory and other theories and other things that, you know, we've got all this volume of material that we produced before. We can't say we were wrong yep. now. Yep. So instead, they got to attack us. But it's not working. <laughs> You know, I kind of feel sorry for these guys now because as you guys, the, you know, as all of us, the average person, as we all just start looking this stuff for, for ourselves, we realize that they're the ones that are full of crap. So while they're out there doing all the mental gymnastic tap dancing, I'm just like, this is great material. I'm going to just do a whole series on Theologians Gone Wild and show how ridiculous their arguments are. So that's kind of how that got started. Yeah, I mean, in particular, I mean, our, our good friend, uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, I mean, I put out a video probably a couple of weeks ago, and it really got to him. And, you know, I was uh, taking, you know, I titled the video, and I kind of paraphrased it, which, which I told him when he started bombarding me with messages on my Facebook. Um, but really what, what he was saying, in a nutshell, was that, you know, God would not teach any specific cosmology so not to offend any other cultures. He went so far as to say that what if he had taught a modern day cosmology, then all the ancients would have been offended and it would have been crazy to them. He did it multiple times. So I even, you know, took the quote, I put the, you know, in quotes, everything, you know, he verified that. So, you know, I had asked multiple people, where am I getting, it? you're out of context, I'm out of context. What do you mean by saying that God would not want to offend other cultures by teaching a specific cosmology. And I'm saying, this is what they're holding to, and they're saying that. And you know the reason why I know that Dr. Danny Faulkner is running away from this a little bit, maybe he went a little too far with that quote, is because Pastor Jason Hagen, in my story opening up this conference at Fellowship Baptist Church, told me the exact thing verbatim. He said, listen, he goes, it's not important, there is no specific cosmology taught in the Bible, verbatim. And again, that is completely verified, and anyone can check and ask him himself. Give him a call. He's right in the city. The two churches I talked about, they're there. Ask him. I'm not saying, don't be rude about it. Every church has a right to believe what they want to believe. But at some point, you come to a point and say, I side with the Bible, or I side with NASA and astronauts. All I'm saying is it comes down to that, and that's all I want from churches. Just at least put it in writing. We've made our decision. We're sitting on this side, or we're sitting on this side. The idea of being able to be riding on the fence when it comes to like these cosmology science, it's over. And again, this is what is happening, and we're moving it in that direction, where one by one, and I mean, there's people here that are even from the, these churches, and they're suffering in silence. And soon, you know, maybe not next week, maybe next year, but just getting encouraged, hearing things, is like, now I'm ready, maybe I'll write that letter. Maybe I'll, you know, I'm not gonna be, you know, but they're, they're scared about what's coming. But when multiple people start speaking up, now it's a real issue. And again, when they can't shut up the, like us, now they got a real issue, and now they're going to have to address it, whether it's through a debate, whether it's through a coordinated, and it's going to be a sad day when churches one by one start siding with science or the Bible, or being a literal or not, and saying, no, we're going to actually take that, that's allegory, and it stands allegory. You've actually taken that verse, and you've made it that. But again, at least we will know where we stand. And I'll tell you one thing, there will be one particular denomination, I'm not sure which one, but it will be a big day when they take that stand and they say, no. 
We, right across the board, are taking that side. Because again, it will come to a point where it's going to pressure a lot of different ministries, churches, where are they going to stand? And I think that, you know, this, this discussion, while we can take the negative part, I'm also going to actually kind of look at kind of the positive aspects of what's going on when we talk about different people. So, I don't know, like, uh, Matt, like, do you want to comment maybe on, uh, you know, what you're seeing when it comes sure. to this? Um, what was the website you had? Something heretics.com? <laughs> We, well, that's kind of funny. It was probably from before. Yeah, well, because I was getting blacklisted from all these other conferences and stuff and being called a heretic or whatever, and other guys that were starting to believe similar things to me were also getting blacklisted. I went and got the domain blacklistedheretics.com. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, I forget. I'll be there soon. Eventually, we'll outnumber them. I'll just welcome them over. Right, the pictures? Can you add the pictures? <laughs> yeah, I didn't do anything with the website yeah. yet, but I have the domain. That's what I though. <laughs> no, I just... I would I would echo a little bit what Rob said and what I said in my my deal. I think it's a matter of they have something they don't want to risk losing, uh, especially the big ones, especially the big Christian research people. The same for traditional scientists. Um, they have they have established themselves as an authority using that stuff. Like that's their currency, right? And and they don't want to give it up and. That's why it's such an amazing thing when you have a Rob Skiba who has a lot of that and is willing to say, hey, maybe I don't know it all. And that's all Rob did. He just mm -hmm. stood up and was a shield mm -hmm. for a ton of people in this room sure. so that they could learn, including myself, mm -hmm. in the safety of my own home. And once I figured it out, I was like, now it's my turn. Rob's done it. Like I, I, I kind of see it as kind of – not paying him back, but kind of, you know, like, man, I support you. Like, that's awesome. And so uh, I, I hope he gets the recognition he deserves um, whenever the history books write it, just because. Oh, absolutely. He, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it was funny because we were just sitting there and all of a sudden it, it just came up on my text message. And it was my initial in 2015 message to Rob Ski. We're getting your number. Hi, my name is Robbie Davidson, working on this thing. Big admirer of your work. But what's incredible is the people that I'm running into saying, because he was Rob Skiba, and they heard it, they're like, what? But they're like, but it's Rob Skiba. I'm going to look into it. And I think a lot of this dialogue, when we come across someone, and I can mention people even in my surroundings, and because I had a certain amount of respect, they're like, wait a minute, I'm just not going to laugh it off. Because there's a certain amount of respect, and you've affected a lot of people that way. I mean, I was talking to someone actually in a different one that, that you know, has been a skeptic. You know, husband's been really saying, oh, no, no, and she's like, flatters, you're crazy, but whatever, I'll, you know, I'll encourage it. And just after last night, she said, Rob Skiba finally just did it. And he was all excited. He's like, you know, my wife for you know two years is nope, nope, nope. And just last night, she's like, Rob Skiba did it. Rob's affecting a lot of people. But I mean, it's God that is actually completely speaking through him. And again, there's so many times I hear so many stories. I'm like, man, if you even understand, because I get sometimes almost sad when I, you know, I, I know that he's getting beat down. And I mean, we all get beat down. It doesn't the, the further you go in this, you're all. But again, like you said, he kind of stood up. He really just kind of made that position. Um, and then when you're like, oh man, maybe he's going to get, he can't, he can't. Like he, if he only knew, you know, right now someone's being affected. Someone watching this live stream is being affected, you know, right now with the ministry you're doing, right? So it's, it's something that we have to obviously, you know, look to. And yeah. 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 And, I, I, and another thought that talking about like history books and how I forget who you were talking about earlier, the philosopher, but it was basically just like a cracked out Satanist. Um, uh, which one was it? wasn't. Uh, Pythagoras? I can't, who? Pythagoras? Yeah, yeah, just so. <laughs> cracked out Satanists. Cracked out Satanists. And so I was thinking, like, you know, like if, if this movement is squashed, like. Let's get those domains. Let's just get them all, you know? Two, yeah. 200 out. years. I figure, like, 200 years from now, like, say this is all squashed, and, like, the history books are talking about the great philosopher, like, PewDiePie or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, yeah, he was a revolutionary, and, yeah. you know? Yeah. All these people followed him, anyways. What about you, like Emmanuel? Like, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, with your church and stuff, and I know that you know some people know of the channel and stuff, and you know, where have you been with that journey? And like, I mean, I think I asked you at one point. I said, if they ever came to you, because I mean, you knew my story. I told yeah. you that, but an ultimatum. I mean, how would you take that? Would you kind of be like, oh, I got, or you'd be like, whatever, you know? And it was just one of those things where I'd be curious to know, you know, in in your world, what are you kind of experiencing, or what do you think is happening? Well, it's the thing is. Um, first, you have to, uh, you, once you make that decision of, you know, I know I'm going to be persecuted for standing up for this truth, then, you know, with, with that kind of mindset, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be more, you'll be prepared to handle the heat that comes with it. God will not give you more than what you can handle. 
Mm. That's, that's, that's found in the scriptures as well. You cannot, you're not given according to what you cannot be able to bear. So I've been able to come across even like, um, I spoke to a few people at my church. Um, I, am a, I am primarily, I will put this out there, um, I, am, I am primarily a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Um, okay. and so Thank you. I do know that this is something that, uh, you know, even in my church, they do not, they don't um, talk about these, these kinds of messages. Um, and these are things that, you know, everybody hushes away from and then they say, oh, uh, you know what, let's just, let's not get too distracted by this. But here's the thing, I, this is an important thing to, to bring out there because if this message is bringing people, unbelievers, I'm talking people who are atheists, if this is able to draw them to the scriptures and actually say, wow, I thought I was a descendant of, of a monkey and I thought that I was related to that baboon or this. If, if this thing can actually get them to come away from that and say, whoa, you mean to tell me that I've been living in a matrix the entire time and whoa, you mean to tell me that our, our reality is actually confirmed by, this, by the scriptures and it draws them to Jesus Christ at the end of the day? Why, why push this away? You know, it's one of those things that I did bring to a few people in my, uh, in my church. And first reaction, they laughed at me. You know, it's one of the things that, mm. you know, they, they laughed at me. And I said, hey, you know what? First, first of all, just before you laugh, before you further, um, you know, um, say, say this is nonsense and you back away from it. You have to ask the question, what would make pilots, engineers... And uh, people who are who are actually even even like geologists and people who actually have studied a lot of things. I primarily am a, am an engineer. I, I I am a power engineer and I also am a journeyman uh, uh, in 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 in, in, uh, in an HVAC trade. We had to study all of these things. We had to study um, all the things about physics. In order in engineering, physics is a big thing, and you have to know what gravity is, you have to know what all of these things are. So yes, um, you know, you just have to ask the question, well, what would make so many different people who are actually educated to come into this, this movement and actually say, listen, our whole reality has been, it's, it's been nothing but a sham, really. We've been, we've been living off of the tube. What you see on t TV, that's basically what is dictating to you what reality is. But it's been propaganda that's been fed to you from childhood. And you grew up believing, oh, this is this, this is not, oh, yes, in 1969, we landed on the moon. And, then, and, and what we did was we put uh, mirrors on the moon and we can be able to shoot, you can be able to, to, to prove that there. But prior to that, they were, they were, they were doing, uh, they, were, they were beaming laser to the moon and back prior to this whole 1969 moon landing in the first place. And so the thing that actually I began to, uh, when I actually look in, looked into this, I also, I also found out and I brought this to, uh, to the attention of people also in my church, where I said, listen, if you look at the origin of heliocentrism and you go to look at even Copernicus himself, what you will find interesting is he was a known occultist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a, there's a Masonic lodge that is called the, the Copernicus Lodge or Lodge Copernicus. I didn't make this up. If you go on Google, you can find this. Anybody can find this out there. Isaac Newton. That is also another occultist. In fact, um, there was a video that came, that surfaced on YouTube, which was showing a ritual that was being done by Freemasons. And guess who they honored? Sir Isaac Newton. So you got to think, you got to ask the question, if these people are tied by one thing, and that is sun worship, what would then, why, why like how, how difficult is it to understand that they would ultimately try and create our reality to revolve around the sun? It's sun worship. That's all it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point, because like I said, you got the Egyptians, you got the Greeks, I mean, you see a consistency 
with the occultism getting the sun and exactly. you know you got raw you know so again while I don't go so far as saying if someone believes in heliocentrism they're sun worshippers it's striking to see that nothing new happens under the sun exactly. the stuff that was going on Babylonian it's happening in a different package could it be you know and, and I think you bring up a really a, a really good point as well when it comes to bringing up the occultic nature of whether it's NASA and the space agencies getting into you know getting into these great pivotal men of you know Pythagoras you know and Aristophanes and when you actually start digging into it you're like whoa wait a minute like these guys all have pretty shady connections with the mystery schools and all these sort of things um, but I have been able to talk to you know other Christians and you know these things start resonating and I think it's important that we understand whether it's biblical that we do baby steps and not just jump right. I mean, it, it shocked us to the core, all of us. And we were probably, you know, pretty primed. We'd looked at a lot of stuff. Can you imagine the shock, you know, jumping right to this? We almost got to start in baby steps. But even non-biblically, I think it's important too to just to kind of slowly, you know, work it in. Because again, some of these things are just so incredibly profound. But when you do your research, you kind of see the kind of this connection, you know, coming through. So it's uh, it's something that's incredibly important. But I think what we'll do right now, um, we've got, uh, you know, a few minutes here left. We should probably open it up to, you know, people want to ask the, the panel or anyone here in particular, and we can maybe have some discussions, maybe what's going on. Uh, you know, maybe questions you have, what you're seeing. Again, we're we're seeing a lot, and we're kind of you know talking amongst each other, and we're we're formulating plans um, to kind of move forward and do things, you know, the best we can. But again, you know, if there's certain things that uh, you know you want to know and you want to ask, this is probably the best time to do it. What do we got, uh, John, for time? Yeah, I was going to do Donahue style, so you just pick who you want, and I'll take the mic to them. Twenty, good, good, good. Yeah, can we put up the lights a little bit so I can see who, who has? Uh, Jared, get has, those lights. So you can bring those up a bit, and I'll try to see. Like, uh, okay, we got one in the back right here. All right. <laughs> You can come meet me, that's fine. I want uh, all four of you, or who knows about this, I'm sure we all do, but share with the people about the CERN opening and the satanic service. Share with them the Satan statue in Detroit. Share with them the stuff that has eaten people alive. Please. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 that, I got it right here, but like maybe, you know, yeah. maybe just we'll get one person. Just take one person. The, the, the Did you hear? Is a, yeah, the question was about yeah. CERN in uh, Switzerland. Um, how many of you are familiar with that? Opening ceremony? Oh, yes, the opening <laughs> ceremony. Okay, well, quite a bit of people have already are familiar with that there. Um, they were doing basically this. Uh, here's, okay. Since when was it so significant that you have to do some, a bizarre ceremony when you just, when you've opened up a tunnel? They just, that's, all they, that's all they did it was, was once they, when they opened the, tu the, the tunnel in Switzerland, they then ended up basically doing a, a bizarre satanic ritual. And there's, uh, I think it was, this, I think it's the statue of Shiva. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it was. Outside, outside yeah. Yeah, the yep. statue of Shiva. The god Shiva. of destruction. <laughs> yeah. And Shiva in Eastern mysticism is a god of destruction. And the dance that they were doing was actually a dance that was... What that's, it's, it's a ritualistic dance that points to the, to the God of Destruction. So why would they do those kinds of dances? Exactly, and this is science. It's a right? There's science. Against religion exactly. and they're going, but what religions are they going towards is even more profound sometimes, right? But it's a good point, absolutely. Well, yeah, but uh, in ancient times, the area where CERN is located today was a town called Ap Apoliacum, which was the center for Apollo worship. And it all goes back to Apollo. I mean, everything's Apollo, 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 the Apollo program. It's all, it, Apollo is a sun god, right? And if you take the CERN logo and look at the CERN logo, it looks like three sixes stacked on top of each other. I mean, they're putting it right in front of your face. It's constantly Apollo 666B system over and over and over again. My take on that, and they're being very open and honest about it. I mean, they, you listen to these scientists talk about, yeah, you know, we're opening up gateways and portals and maybe we'll see stuff come in or whatever. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, what are you talking about, man? And th these are people who believe that we got here as a result of a big bang. A big explosion created everything in the universe. And then they'll say, yeah, we are trying to recreate the Big Bang. <laughs> the conditions of the Big Bang. It's like, uh, does it, yeah, like, you know, oh, wait a minute. You think we got here because of the Big Bang and you're trying to recreate that? That's like not good. <laughs> you know?
Like, I have to explain. Why do I have to explain this to you? <laughs> it isn't tricky, too, because you bring up the 666, and you know, in Revelations, where it says, let them have wisdom, understand, 666 is number of man. And what is science pursuit? Men can achieve. Men can break the code. Men can. And I mean, if we start looking, I mean, in your presentation, you brought up all the variables, 666, and like speeds, and like, I mean, you just start bringing all of their globe heliocentric models, and you just over and over and over. And what I found, you know, significant was the number of man. And science really has basically completely indoctrinated man thinking we can achieve, we can do all things. You know, science is the answer. It, can, it will fix global warming. It will fix everything. They have the idea that basically science has not come become like a savior, you know? So, you know, I think yeah, it's great to bring on CERN, but let's go with another question to ask the panel over here. Yeah, one over here, Robbie. Okay, yep. Mm. Uh, my name's Guy. <clears throat> my wife and I uh, uh, are kind of new to this, and I came to be a believer before she did. I actually got plummeted with a thousand questions on the way here, <clears throat> which I really couldn't answer all. So uh, one of the questions she asked was, uh, how do you explain uh, meteor showers? Uh, I think we're supposed to have something like that going on right now. Um, and also, I've been trying to find uh, the Bible verse in the book of Revelations that actually says flat plateau. I, I can't remember where that is found. And God bless you all. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, there's no, well, the Matthews Bible, which is an, an ancient Bible, actually it's, it's like First or Second Samuel, I think. There's, there's a verse that specifically says flat earth. But none of our modern translations have a single verse anywhere that says the earth is flat, period, or anything like that. It's all of the descriptions that we do get that leads you, that's the only conclusion you could have uh, when you look into it. So that you're not going to see an English translation that specifically says that. Um, it's all internal witness that you, you build upon through you know, a variety of different descriptions. Uh, as far as meteor showers, you know, one of the things I find interesting is the question is the shape of the earth. And almost unanimously, people start immediately start looking up. Like, wait, wait, wait. The topic is, what is the shape of the Earth? And they want, well, how does the sunset work? How does the moon work? What's the lunar eclipse? What is this? I'm like, wait, wait, let's figure this out first. <laughs> You're changing the goalposts here. You know, let's talk about the Earth. Mm -hmm. What are meteor showers? I have no idea. Personally, I don't know if anybody else here does, but uh, I have seen them. You know, certainly I've seen them. When I look into the biblical description of the stars, I mentioned earlier that all the stars are falling to earth. So immediately that tells me they are not suns with planets going around them. They are very small, very close, you know, localized things. But we see throughout scripture uh, the, the word star and angel is interchangeable over and over and over again. There are sentient beings. Revelation chapter 9, I saw a star fall from heaven and to him was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit, right? Uh, the hosts of heaven are interchangeable for the armies of God or the constellations. And the Israelites are always getting in trouble for worshiping the hosts of heaven. So uh, all throughout scripture, stars and angels are interchangeable uh, the, uh, descriptions. So the only conclusion I can come to, biblically speaking then, is that stars are sentient beings. And the book of Enoch goes into tremendous detail and tells you point blank that the stars are sentient beings and that there's a, uh, uh, an angel named uh, Raguel, I think is his name, is uh, specifically in charge of the, of the luminary class of angels to make sure that they're heavenly John Gabrielsons, they're police officers <laughs> uh, of the stars, to make sure that they stay in the courses because if God put a gospel in the stars, then the stars have to maintain that imagery so that the story doesn't get messed up. But there are wandering stars that are messing up that story and Jude says that those stars are reserved for judgment. Question, why does God need to judge a rock? <laughs> why does God need to judge gas? <laughs> if these things are being judged, that implies that they did something wrong, which implies that they are sentient beings. So what are shooting stars? I don't know. Maybe they're cosmic chips patrol. They're doing their patrol. I don't know. Yeah, another fascinating thing with stars is like usually you give names to things that are living or sentient. When you talked about that. God calls them all by name. Correct. He gave them each a name. 
You know, and it talks about the grains of the sand. He numbered, numbered the hairs, you know, on our head. But it clearly says each one has a distinct name. They come in a different glory. So it's just really intriguing because, you know, the animals are named. This what, is named. Stars what I love about this movement is that I, I don't see anybody ever skirting around the truth. And the Bible, I know, specifically says to be prepared to give a defense for the hope that lies within us. And, and I want to... Uh, go into this with a f with an open mind, and to me, uh, that question is an important question as far as what we're uh, talking about. Because uh, a meteor to somebody who doesn't believe is going to say, "Well, if we live in a dome, where the heck did that come from?" Yeah, right? You know what I'm saying? I, I, I want to be prepared to give a, a, an mm -hmm. answer. I, I hear what you're saying, but also I also want to be able to uh, defend the hope that lies within me. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe there are, uh, there's just too much evidence to, to support that we live on a flat earth. I know scripture and, and, and I've been taught uh, my whole Christian walk to uh, um, test everything in light of scripture. And, and that's what I want to do. And I just, uh, again, I, I love all you guys and I think this is something I hope that all Christians go into with an open mind and not uh, uh, be judgmental so quickly to push it aside. And so um, my wife and I, we are praying that people do have an open mind and uh, take every question seriously. Thanks. I would hey, like... Oh, Emmanuel, uh, Robbie, I had a question right here. If you... uh, do you want to say something real quick on that? Oh, no, no, I was just going to add just, uh, I don't know if I had showed you because I had, I went and I got the P900 mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> yeah. that's all. That's, okay, how many people have the P900 here? <laughs> how many people are getting the new P1000? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good advertisement for them because um, that camera can actually allow you to see the the stars in such a way that I was blown away. To be honest, I was blown away. I, I was able to look at some of the stars um, with the camera, and when I saw them, even like the star Venus, there is no way like the, those those stars the, like that, that we're seeing. There's a reason why we sing that song, "Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star." They're twinkling stars, and when you look at them, they actually change colors. Yeah, I haven't seen the sun twinkle once, right? They're supposed to be all suns, so yeah, it's a good point. That's the point. thing. They change colors. And what I tried to do was I, I took a few images on my camera. I didn't bring the camera with me, though. It's still there. I took the, an, an, an image in one second, and it was, I think I captured it in the red, red color. And then after that, I, I took another picture, and then it was, um, it was like a purplish type of a color. They changed. All of the stars are different. They go back and forth and it's, cool. it's Yeah, no, it, it's, it's amazing. There's the technology that's helping us to see things in a whole new way, and it's amazing. John, do you have the next question yes, there? Question. Okay. Hello, my name is Omar Moalam. I'm an independent journalist covering the event. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Robbie, personally, uh, for letting us uh, uh, come here. I, I certainly admire the Flat Earther's commitment to asking questions and skepticism and uh, and confronting authority. It's very much in the spirit of what we do as journalists, so I just want to, to put that out there. Um, I have two questions. The first one is actually, because this is the only chance I'm going to get to do that, is if I could like quickly pull the audience for my own research. I'm wondering how many people here today considered themselves Creationists. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So my 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 real question is um, with with uh, throughout this you you're very much dedicated to questioning science as we know it, or at least scientific knowledge. And you do that by doing your own research and by testing things. And there's very much the motto is research or you know ask questions, but you, the, the four of you have all brought up supernatural things that can't really be tested or proven. Uh, Emmanuel, you talk about demon spirits in your YouTube videos. Uh, Rob, you mentioned angels in your last presentation. Uh, Robbie, you told me that God communicated to you through a, a VHS, sort of a divine VHS. And Matt, you said that Christ physically touched you 
on the back when you were younger. So my question then for you guys is like, why don't you approach the beliefs about demons, angels, your own supernatural experiences with the same scientific rigor and skepticism that you do science? Why don't you approach the existence of hell without the same rigor? Because I think to me and to maybe some of the people who are not creationists in this audience, it kind of undermines your credibility to not treat the knowledge of scientists with the same, uh, the same way that you treat the Bible. I think, it's, I think it's a great point, Rob. But, uh, well, my first thought is you just made a huge assumption that we didn't test our beliefs. That's a massively huge assumption. Uh, we did test our beliefs, at least I did. I've tested my beliefs. Uh, I've done a lot of research into why I, why I believe the Bible, why the Bible, what the path the Bible has gone through in the course but, of history. But angels specifically, that was the example that I brought up. But that's an experiential thing. That's something where you it, tangibly experience something. If I, if I it has nothing baseball, to do with the earth. It has not, I mean, it's well, irrelevant in the sense it has nothing to do with earth. If I threw a baseball and hit you in the head, would you dispute the experience of that? <laughs> or would you say, hey, I got hit in the head with a baseball? Uh, see, I mean, it's experience that you can't deny. You got hit in the head with a baseball. Uh, if Well, prove it's a baseball, right? <laughs> prove it's a baseball. Um, you know, I can only speak from my own experiences, uh, both for, on the good side and the bad side, that I've had hardcore demonic experience that is pure evil, uh, that I have experienced myself and have seen cast out in the name of Jesus. Uh, there are countless testimonies of people that... Uh, of things happening in, in a supernatural sense that science doesn't have an answer for, that only the name of Jesus worked on. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, what do you do with that? You see it with your own eyes. You feel it with your own senses. Um, do you deny it or do you accept it? Well, something just happened. I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask a question. Let's say, let's say me and you went shopping and I bought an apple. And then uh, just one apple, and it's for me. And then I tell you to watch me. I watch, I, I watch this apple, and then I take a bite. I'll ask you a question. How did that apple taste? What will your answer be? Will you know how it tasted? No. That's because you need to taste it for yourself to be able to understand that it really tastes good or, oh, this apple tastes kind of, huh, you know? So me personally... I've had numeral, numerous amount of experience before. In fact, I actually was one of those who tried to run away from the gospel a few times. I tried to run away from it. I actually wanted to be a rapper. <laughs> Trust me, I wanted to be a rapper. Glad that went down the drain. <laughs> and then after that, I actually wanted to be, a, I wanted to be a, 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 a music producer. I wanted to be the next Dr. Dre. That's, that's, that was my, my motto. I was the next Dre is what I called myself. Uh, but that was all foolishness because I was trying to do things to actually fit in with the rest of the world around me. I wanted to be the same like everybody else. But I've had several experiences. I used to be a gamer. And when I played those video games, the violent video games, I experienced things even in my, in, in, at night. Because there were times when I went to sleep, and then the game station would, start, would turn on at the exact same time. And those, this is not a game that, you, that just turns on by itself, even for updates. You got to go and physically press the button to turn it on. I've had several experiences in which I know for a fact that... We are not even, you might look around you and you might see that this is all you see. But I can tell you, if you, ta if, if, you, if you experience God for yourself, or you actually experience what actually, what the real world is in, the, in, in our real reality, there are angels in this room, and yes, there are powers of darkness as well. All at work. I will tell you this because I experienced this myself. I actually ha I, I heard an audible voice that did not want me to pray because I was struggling before with certain temptation. Something came up and as I started to pray for the name of Jesus Christ, I heard an audible voice that actually was, was afraid of the prayer. And I can tell you, um, you, I have the testimony as well, I shared it on my YouTube channel. Someone called me, I didn't even expect this. As I was praying with this person over the phone, 
when I was mentioning the name of Jesus Christ, and that's where I'll tell you all, there's power in the name of Jesus, because when I prayed with this man, he was struggling with a lot of, a lot of sexual temptations. There was a dark voice that began to come out from him, and, and I didn't even know what it was. So these things are real. I didn't even expect anything like that. Um, I'm not, we're not, people automatically think that, you know, the minute you talk about angels and demons and that spirits are real, oh, you're, you're just, you're wearing a tinfoil hat and you're not looking at, you're not rationalizing things. I tried to rationalize it before. But for how long will you rationalize these things before you realize, wait, there's something going on here that I'm not looking into. Yeah, there's some things obviously, you know, that science cannot settle. And again, you can come at it and say, well, that doesn't apply the scientific method, but there is definite aspects there. Matt, do you want to say, yeah, we, I mean, we, I, we I, gotta wrap this up real quick. Sure, I just think, you know, if, if you close your eyes and you ask someone to touch you and you feel a hand on your back, I mean, I don't think you're supposed to deny your senses. Uh, and I think your question also, which, which I appreciate your question, it's a good question, it also comes from the standpoint that I think you're assuming that science has a better track record than the Bible, which talks about spiritual things, which I don't think is the case when you just look at the number of editions of science books and where it's come from, yet we're still in the first edition of the Bible, which is to be clear, that's, that's not what I'm trying to say. I just, I just detect a double standard. Well, I would, yeah, I would bring up It's a double system. standard because you're making an assumption. You, you, you start out with, we didn't test these things, which is false. Hmm. I, I mean, I can't speak for everybody up here, but I have. I've struggled through many things in my life, questioning my faith, questioning the Bible, lots of things. But, but, you know, I was a missionary for six and a half years, and I saw stuff. I saw people get healed that had, defies all scientific explanation, supernatural healing in the name of Jesus, you know. There are lots of things that you start with a preconceived bias of saying you, didn't, you guys are, have a double standard and you're not testing these things without knowing anything about any of us. But I, but I would also say that physical science is limited to physical things. Sure. Well, absolutely. absolutely. And when, yep. you re when you see something in the spiritual take place, you right. have to say there's something beyond science. But you did bring up a good one. I want to bring this up. On the flip side, you did bring up why are we applying the, the scrutiny and the scientific method trying to prove hell. And again, it's very, very simple. They tried. They can only go eight miles. Okay? So, you know what? They've done it for us. We can't go. We can't prove it. And yet they'll tell us all the layers of the earth. Again, a lot of stuff that's taught is not science. It's there was theories some of myths. interesting stuff that they supposedly had recorded when they were down that deep. Some very interesting stuff. And uh, if, you're, if you're squeamish, I wouldn't invite you to look up. Uh, what that sounded like. So the fact of the matter is, we, we would go that direction. Again, look it up. The furthest that man has been able to drill is eight miles. Look at basically the dimensions. How do they know anything? Again, it's speculation, it's theories, and yet you know when someone understands how little they can do, uh, and yet they have all the knowledge of what's at the core. Come on, that's not science. You're moving away from the true scientific method. But we got to wrap this up. But I wanted to do, just have each of you be able to again, because again we're going to have people are skeptical. I mean, we've done this whole panel, and again, understand that this is the Bible panel. The next one up after the break will be the non-religious panel. You can ask all the questions. You, no Bible if you don't want anything. Rob will even answer non-Bible questions, absolutely. He'll be on that. So, I want to just leave it with this, because I think it's important. We've addressed a lot of the people that, you know, might be Christians or Christians or believing in the Bible, but let's just leave off with one big thing. If you're going to say a quick two, three minute thing to someone that says, yeah, man, I don't believe in the Bible. Why should I even take you guys seriously when you bring up the Bible? If anything, I don't think you guys should bring up the Bible at all in the investigation on the true creation. You know, what would you say, Rob? Yeah, I hear that a lot, and, and with this movement or whatever you call it, we do in these conferences, and sometimes there's complaints that, hey, you know, I spent however much money to attend a conference. I didn't come for a Bible revival meeting. Uh, I, I, it's a legitimate complaint. I get it. But the simple fact of the matter is, when people they, in the Army, they used to say there's no atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> well, there's no atheist in a terrarium either. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you, oh, yeah, that's if a good you, point. I wanted to bring that up. You brought that up. Sorry to interject. Sorry to interject. But I'm curious because I've had media say this. Is there anyone here that believes in flat Earth that's an atheist? Is there anyone? Okay, there well, is one. Here. Good. One. I want to talk to you afterwards because yeah. I've been waiting a long time to talk to a flat Earther that's 100% atheist. Or two. Good. Because Come to me afterwards. The alternative, if 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 you understand the Earth is flat, and especially if you believe it's an enclosed world system, then your only default is to say the aliens did it. 
So you've just substituted God right But then who created the aliens? And then who, like, you're, you, you, still, you still have this, either it's an accident, there's no created or intelligent design. It's just, you know. So anyways, that's interesting. I definitely want to talk to you later. But yeah, again, it's for the skeptics are saying, you know, but why should I take the Bible se serious? Again, when we get into apologetics. Why in the well, world yeah, are we even for talking me, about the Bible? I, I tell people, don't believe a thing I say anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't believe me. I'm just sharing with you what my experience is, and I'm always telling you to go test your belief. You know, that's what I look. Okay, you don't believe it, fine, but test it. Don't just tell me I don't believe the Bible. Go research it. Like, go out and test it. If you guys want to talk about empirical evidence, well, I hear people all the time say, well, you, you know, you never test your faith. You never test. Your, how do you know that? I've spent a lot of time testing my faith. Uh, believe me. Um, <laughs> and. There are other people throughout history, and some fairly recent guys, you know, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis and um, uh, what's his name, that the evidence demands a verdict, uh, Josh McDowell. McDowell yep. and there are other guys out there who started out as hardcore atheists, same thing, I'm going to go prove this wrong, right? Oh, oh, I'm a convert, and by the way, I'm writing lots of books now on Christian apologetics. Uh, Case for Christ, another Case for example. Christ. Um, look, don't just say you don't believe it, go out and test it. That's what this whole thing is about. I mean, that's why I have my website, testingtheglobe.com, because that's what I was doing, is testing what I thought I believed about the globe. And I would say the same thing about religion and... Man, Emmanuel, what, what, would, what would you say to someone that's just basically like, man, what, what, like, how, religion, give me a break. Like, what, you know, what would be your parting words to someone that's just a basic skeptic, like, what he about said. the Bible? End of story. <laughs> All right. Grab it in. Just joking. <laughs> nice. No, I would... Uh, I, ultimately, you know, honestly, I think it would be... Uh, when you share your testimony, when you share your personal, when I, I don't like to just tell people, okay, hey, believe, believe the Bible because the Bible is the word of God, end of story, drop the mic, that's gravity too. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, ultimately, I, it, people like to know that, you know, this God that you worship, he is real, he exists, and he is a personal God. So, for me personally, I, if, when I like to share my story, my journey, how we escaped the war in my country and how by miracles we were able to like basically go weeks and like we basically a long time without food no water and we were like and we were not weak we were not hungry we were good there's so many things i can i can tell but i can i can tell you for for a fact there is a god um by sharing my by, by sharing my test my personal experience then, you know, that's ultimately, I think, the best route to go about it. I don't like to just tell people to believe something without uh, testing it themselves. Like, you know, it's best ultimately. And you can prove the Bible through world history. World history confirms b the Bible. A hundred, a hundred percent. You can go and look at world history. The prophetic events, all the kingdoms outlined in Daniel, Revelation, all of these things are exactly as how it was outlined in scriptures today. All the events happening today are all pointing us to the scriptures. That's what I'll. That's uh, that's what I'll just say. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I would look up. You know, just type in Christian apologetics, and you're going to get a dose of stuff. Because I was the biggest skeptic. I'm like, I just question every single thing. And again, like I said, go into it really critical. Try to prove that sucker. But you'd be surprised what you find, Matt. For me, it's the physical evidence of the reliability of the scriptures compared to any other ancient document that's out there. It's it's staggering. Like when you compare it to the Iliad or uh, even Shakespeare, for example, we have no original manuscripts of any Shakespeare plays, but we don't doubt that Shakespeare wrote those plays. And, yeah. you know, and so uh, I don't want to butcher the numbers, but they're staggering. If, if it's important to you, go do the research. Um, a thousand to one staggering that the Bible um, hmm. is true and has not been altered over the over the years. So. Well, Matt Long, his YouTube channel is Flatworth. You got Emmanuel Lakonga, which is The Controversy 7 on YouTube. You got Rob Skiba, and I'm Celebrate Truth. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, having us and doing everything. Thanks. Mm. Hang on a sec. I just want to add one more thing, and this is a prayer that is guaranteed to be answered. Guaranteed. I'm looking for it. God, if you're real, yes. prove it. Yes. Yes. Reveal yourself to me. That's good. Yeah. He, it's all about a relationship. It's not about a book. It's all about a relationship. And he actually wants to have that relationship. All you got to do is ask. So if you're really skeptical, mm -hmm. <laughs> start asking that.
Yeah. He actually likes skeptical people. Like, yeah, look at Thomas. Does. Thomas, he actually embraces skeptical people. Go at him skeptical. Say, prove it. But be sincere. Give him at least more than a week. <laughs> he, he, he likes to make you wait. <laughs> right, Rob? Getting that answer? Okay. Thank you. So we'll take the break. Get up. Get up. Who's that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, uh, you did go off on your go. Guys, we're going to take a uh, Sorry, quick 10-minute break. Is that what you just said, Robbie? Did you just tell them we're going to take a quick 10-minute break? Quick 10-minute break? 10-minute break, guys, and then be back in here for the next panel. And uh, tonight when the dinner is happening, if you can hear me on the way out, if you're in the VIP dinner, it's going to be in conference room number five. Conference room number five. Do you guys want me to turn these off? Just leave them on? Okay.
Check, check, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Welcome to Finland. <laughs> How many? Uh, well, I don't know. Because we don't have five lights. Okay. I'll sit there and ask the mom. Where do you want me? Bob can sit in the same place, right? Where do you want me? Here. I'm Ellen. Hey, I just got to talk to your daughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. She said you're here. Oh, no. Yeah, that's pretty rude. Oh, right. Nice to hear I might throw a little on you if you want. Everybody, because my husband. Yeah, yeah, for you, man. I'm trying to connect with you. I'm like the around here. Hey, you're on stage, I'm on stage. I know. Are you going to the mic? Are you going to the mic? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Initially, I was like, I hope all of our mics work. Hello, hello. Hello, Sorry, anyone monitoring the mic? I have to call. <coughs> check, 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 check. This one's on. Good, good, good. Check, check, check. This one works. That's the other lapel. You guys want to wear one? You can wear a lapel then. Check, check. How do I know if mine works? Check one, two. I can put a lapel on two of these guys and one, two of them can hold the mic. Is that cool? Would you rather wear this or hold that? I got it. I did it yesterday. Testing, testing. Is this close enough? I know you did. Broke, what do you think? Is this okay? I'm not going under my shirt. I know that. Yeah. I think I should? I was hoping I was catching I should it. research it? <laughs> yeah, I said, should no, I, I research it? No. Awesome. Like bumper stickers. Maybe she should get the mic. Uh, well, I'm testing. Oh, yeah. Much better. <laughs> How are we going to make her louder? We will bring her levels up when she speaks. I feel like doing... Or... Mic. Mic. Yeah. Yeah. Try the hand like put it right now. Or is this working? Oh, it's working there. Try it again. Alright. Okay. 
was it? So how do we do the uh, mason sign again with our hands? <laughs> what do we do with our hands? I'm just kidding. <laughs> how do we do the mason? Sure oh, you mean like are we doing this? Yeah, just make sure not to do what's that one? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do don't, this, like don't, yeah, don't do what I did. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm taking off in a flight. Right. <laughs> White knuckles. Really? You're gonna photo bomb us? Really? <laughs> you should research flatter. What's this for? You should research flatter. Oh! I've heard this is a thing. You should tell her. No, that's a You should do it. <laughs> Who gave you these? I don't know. Cammy just gave it to me. Oh. Hey, Mark, did I put my water? Oh, no, you put this. That's good. <laughs> oh, you okay? Forget about it. I didn't know if he's okay. Attention, everyone. I don't know if you're able to hear me or not, but if you're in the lobby or the ante room, come on in and have a seat. We're going to start a panel show. Keep her in here. And the topic, believe it or not, is flat earth. <laughs> Research flat earth. <laughs> I'll wait a couple seconds until everyone comes and has a seat. We're kind of working out the sound issues. Are you dimming the lights for this? Yeah, it's a little bright. Yeah, I am a little loud. Uh, Height-wise, compared to all of you, and also... <laughs> You're a little feedbacky. Yeah. I know, if they crank up her levels anymore, she's going <laughs> to... Well, it's um, on my uh, phone, it's 3.33, weirdly enough. Uh, Perfect time to start, right? Well, I really enjoyed everything so far on day two of the Flat Earth Conference, and this is the first time I've, I've ever been to Edmonton. I've been to other places in Canada. And uh, really happy to be here. And the mall is amazing. And I did Doorbell. buy a couple of things there. Unfortunately, I said I wouldn't, but I did. Well, I somebody uh, open the door. <laughs> Dinner? Are you ready? Avon? There, it's coming. Project Blue Beam. <laughs> Is that, are we all Pavlov's dogs? That's a really bad fire alarm. That is the worst this fire alarm ever. Oh, it's my microphone. <laughs> but nobody knows what that bell is or how to stop it? Anyone? Uh, Globe. It's, it's not your phone, is it? No. <laughs> it's nothing next to us. It's not anybody's phone. It's over the speaker system. It's the house. It's not... It's, it's, Wait. it's not their system. Ah. Uh, trolling his stuff. If you were able to understand those be those beings. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain where you are. Our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. We thank you for your That was a fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> I told him it was a fire alarm. He's like, that's the worst fire alarm ever. It is. <laughs> Oh. Wow. <laughs> is, this a can, is this a Canada thing? This is a thing up here. You're very polite. You're not, not rude at all. <laughs> so somebody pulled the alarm, maybe, you think? Practical joke? Stay where you are. It's a fire alarm alert because people always pull the thing in the mall. So oh. So, oh. so you don't have to evacuate unless it's real. Also, yeah, oh, somebody pulls idea. the alarm in the entire mall. In America, we're not that we smart. We hear it? Yeah. We just so they could be down by the ice skating rink. Yeah, so security will check it out. Uh, all right. All right, maybe it's gone now. What does everyone think? A pre-alarm. The bell sounds the first part of our first stage alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Currently, look for any immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions from our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. So, what? <laughs> so, I. You gotta stop right in the middle. Go, Bob. If, if David Ooh. Weiss was here, David Weiss would be saying it's conspiracy. The what? If David Weiss is here, be Oh, he absolutely. Yeah. I guess we're all supposed to kiss. <laughs> okay, listen up. I don't know what's going on, but this is my specialty. <laughs> oh, no. And they are letting us know that we need to stay in place. So I need everybody to stay in the room, okay? Make sure this door is secured because it's locked. Pull that door closed also, okay? So does everybody stay calm if we can figure out what's going on?
Robbie's gonna go get somebody. Why are okay. you calm? I am calm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm off duty. This isn't supposed to happen. Uh, please remain where you are. If it was a real fire, we'd all be toast. Yeah. Just done. Just the whole place would be a goal. Yeah. So, no, what I like, I like, it's, so apparently in Canada, there's, this is a pre-alarm. No, no, seriously, that's what he said. He said this is a pre-alarm. This isn't the actual alarm. This is sort of a warm-up to the it's actual alarm. It's actually smart. In the United States, yeah. we'd all be running out. Yeah, yeah, the United States, okay. we'd everybody panic, you know, and we'd just be out the There'd door, no pushing it, get out of the way, blocking with children. It would be incredible, but... This could be a fire alarm pulled. Oh, that's good. That's wow. all. That's that good helps. For, that's good for exits. The mall. <laughs> so if they're sending a security team, how long will it take them to actually find it? It's a big mall. Oh, first, oh, first aid, first aid. Is that a separate switch on the wall? Is that a thing? You get choices. <laughs> Press one for first Press aid. Press one for a Press small two. cut on your wrist. Press two. Would this light take that for your other one? Leave a fire. Uh, the light for the other panel? This is when I wish there was alcohol in this. Anyway. Do you guys think we should just go anyway? Yeah. What does everyone vote? Uh, go anyway? Should we just go anyway? Uh, one word at a time. All right. I'll do it. <laughs> well, welcome. All right. To the most exciting Please panel show. Well, you're going to wait through this part. We'll wait for this part. This part of our first aid alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on our way to locate the source of the alarm. Carefully look for the immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. Your seat can be used as a flotation device. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, right. I mean, we should maybe do it, but it's going to be really distracting. You guys really want to go ahead? Well, if she keeps talking, probably not. It's got to be over in a second. It's got to be. Let's all will it to be well, over. Well, I mean, look, there's, the Canadians are out there. Wait, how long does this thing usually go? Oh. Anybody know? <laughs> Okay. All right. We're going to do it. We're going to go. Let's do it. All right. Welcome to the panel show. Yay! <laughs> I'm your host, bringing the fire, bringing the heat. <laughs> I'm Patricia Steer, and I'm the host of uh, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, which is a YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Uh, on the panel, <laughs> we have Mark Sargent, who you're familiar with, of course, Jaron Campanella, Rob Skiba, and Bob Nordell. And what we're going to do when we're not being interrupted by a woman's voice and a dinging bell are uh, allowing you to ask some questions of these panelists. Maybe, you know, earlier when Mark was on yesterday, some people weren't able to ask, uh, ask him a question because we ran out of time, or maybe you haven't had a chance to ask the other gentleman a question. But first, I've got some questions for them. The bell sounds you have just heard as part of our first stage alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. It's a conspiracy. It is. Okay, well, John just found out from hotel security it is indeed a false alarm, hey. and they're going to take care of it. So, until then, we'll have to deal with this. Yeah. 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 All right, so I've got questions for the panelists, and they're each going to take a turn answering the questions. There will be four different questions. Then after that, we'll open up the floor, like we have in the previous Q&As, if you've got any question at all for anybody here. But first, let's just go with the questions I've got here on my phone. Uh, the first question, and we're just going to start from Mark and then move down the line. The first question is, what is your recommendation regarding how to explain flat earth to others, people who don't know about it, to friends, family, co-workers? What do you think, Mike? Ooh, wow. it's a good question. If I were to be approaching, and I'm sure a lot of you have done it, uh, flat earth to a first-timer, be it a friend, family, or co-worker, co oh boy, uh, 
first thing I would do is I would size them up. And I'm, I don't want to use the Fight Club reference. I would go after what some of these guys have done in the past, which is I would go after NASA first. I would find out where their belief system lied. And I know you're up here in Canada, but I would go after the American space program, more specifically Apollo. I would ask them point blank, do you think the Apollo missions happened. Do you think the Americans went to the moon? No, they didn't. But it, ask them, find out. Because if they believe wholeheartedly that the Americans did go to the moon, then you kind of know where to go from there. I, I never ever recommend people go into like a family environment and say, oh yeah, by the way, the Earth is flat. Try to warm them up to something first. That's just me. Mm -hmm. All right, good answer. Jaron, your answer. Ladies and gentlemen, right. the metal sound we have just heard is part of our first stage alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Gently look for the immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. You know, YouTube's freaking out right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> same, same question you said? Yeah, same question. How would you explain it to friends, family, people that don't know anything about it? I just think that it depends on what kind of person you are. If you're, I see so many people doing activism that are out and able to talk to people on the street, and I think that that's fantastic. And I just watched a video last night of somebody standing on a boardwalk with a sign. Unbelievable. I mean, the amount of people that are, you're seeing or that are seeing that sign and asking questions and... Uh, it's just that, you know, research flat earth or flat earth is that thing that makes anybody stop in their tracks and really uh, kind of pay attention. So it just depends if you're able to do that. I know that that's something that uh, some people wouldn't be able to do in a million years. So if you're that kind of person, then maybe doing what my wife did for a long time, which was she had little cut out pieces of paper and then everywhere she went, she would leave them, whether it was the bank or ATM or grocery store. So in this way, she didn't have to really talk to anybody, but she's still getting the word out. So I think it just comes down to uh, what kind of person you are. All right, um, Rob, what's your answer to the same question? Family, friends, coworkers, strangers, what do you think is the best way to approach them to explain mm. the concept of flat earth? Well, right now I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. We start at 333 and the alarm goes off and we're all on stage. So I'm kind of thinking, <laughs> <laughs> if I was a conspiracy theorist, I'd be a little nervous right now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't really, I don't consider myself a flat earth evangelist, so I'm not like out there, hey, guess what? But if it's something that starts up in a conversation, same thing these guys said basically, uh, as a public speaker I'm trained to try as much as possible to understand my audience and relate to my audience so kind of feel out where they are and like Robbie says, yeah, I gotta figure out where you are with 9-11 and, and the moon landings because if you're on, on either of those pages, you know, and conversation's over. <laughs> um, she believes in 9-11. I'm going to memorize these before it's over. We apologize for any inconvenience. But uh, the curvature math is a good one for me when I want to start the conversation and talk about it. Um, seeing things at a distance you're not supposed to be able to see, water bending, atmosphere in the vacuum, those are the kind of my three go-to starting points. All right, Bob, before she speaks again, <laughs> how would you answer the same question? You are now free to move about the country. <laughs> All right. Well, me personally, I uh, would take the advice of another well-known uh, flat earth YouTuber. And uh, when you, uh, you just don't talk about flat club uh, pretty much. So I would never start out uh, trying to talk directly about flat earth. Um, I usually will talk about something a lot easier, uh, a lot more common sense, like, you know, what happened on 9-11. Uh, I'll point out, you know, the free fall uh, speed of the buildings, you know, falling in 10.2 and 10.6 seconds respectively. Find out what they feel about that. If they're completely against it, um, then you're probably not going to get very far with uh, flat earth subject at all. So, uh, uh, it, but if they're open to it at that point, then I would start going into some of the things that we discussed on Globusters Ladies yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, the bell sound we have just heard is part of our first stage alarm system. We know. Please remain where you are. <laughs> I think she recorded one take, too. I think it is. We should feel like she's reading it every time. Oh, no. He pulled it. Yeah, he probably did. They do, however, ask that you leave an onion in the tip jar for the guy that's been running.
ringing the bell for the last time. <laughs> <laughs> I think Roland pulled the alarm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it was you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much about it, is, uh, you know, feel them out first. Um, if they're not open to any other conspiracy, then it's probably not a good idea to talk about it. And, you know, it's kind of like what Morpheus said in the, in the Matrix movie. Uh, once people are past a certain point or age of indoctrination, it, it's dangerous to bring them out of the Matrix. Hmm? Good answer, good answer. All right, the next question is, and Mark, you're going to kick it off, and we're going to do the same thing. All right with an interruption coming really soon, right? It's like a game that? show, really. <laughs> Are there any personality traits that make a person more accepting of flat earth or less accepting of flat earth? Ooh, uh, p traits that people have. Yeah, like if I was going to try to approach somebody who I thought, just, just off the cuff, if I was going to approach somebody that I thought might be receptive to flat earth, I might go after, I, it's probably a safe answer, but I go after an artistic person first because artistic people, you could almost plot a graph on open-mindedness. And, you know, if they're creative, if they have a lot of cool little hobbies on the side, that's what I'd, I'd probably do. I'd probably go after an artistic person. All right, Jaron, you, you next, but you can answer what would be less likely or more. That's up to you. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, I think that the education system has grooved people that are... Uh, you know, yes men, the people that um, don't buck the trend, that go by the rules, that uh, do any assignment no matter how ridiculous it is, those people went on to get good grades, went on to get college degrees, and um, are the kind of people that are going to be real tough to talk to because they are, uh, you know, they're so groomed to be exactly what the system wants. So if somebody Ladies didn't... Ladies and gentlemen, the bell sound we have just heard part of our first stage alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to go take a stroke to the alarm. Currently, look for any immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. I know, but they're done. They're yeah. Um, and then, you know, people that uh, didn't have a, not didn't have a college degree, but I mean, I went to college for like a month. So I think people like that that kind of, um, saw school for what it really is, or you know, I may have not seen it completely at the time, but those people are open to it. They saw issues with the way we were brought up. They um, saw the issues with what we were taught in school and how that stuff just kind of went away and it wasn't important. So I think those people might be the best people to talk to. They can understand what we're trying to say. Okay, Rob, any personality traits that might make somebody more likely or less likely? Very much the same as what they both said, uh, uh, right brain people. Mm. Uh, I tend to uh, gravitate towards, anyway, as a right brain person myself, uh, tend to be way more open to this stuff. But when you're talking with an artist, I don't have to explain too much to them because they understand things like perspective and how things like that work uh, intuitively. So uh, those would be the type of people that I would immediately have an easy uh, conversation with, I think. Bob. And I'm going to make this easy and say exactly the same thing. Uh, <laughs> artistic, right brain type people, uh, creative people. Uh, are much more open-minded and uh, they think a lot more outside the box. Yes. So absolutely, those would be the type of people I would approach. All right, back to Mark Sargent for the third question. What do you think is the most important aspect of Flat Earth that we might need to concentrate on to get the word out as we move forward? And that could be experiments or um, you know, activism or more YouTube videos or well, what do you think? Yeah, and this is probably the only one we'll pro probably disagree on because everyone's got their own, own take. But it, moving forward for me anyway is going to be trying to reach the top tier media. As, as fast as possible. Uh, networks we haven't gotten to, prime time we haven't gotten to. I mean, we're, we're reaching out in you know, the documentary and things are happening in that arena, but I believe in, in you know, hitting as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And so, even when the media attention is negative, as we've seen in, in some aspects today, you still are of the mindset that... Uh, oh, yeah. No. I, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather the media come at us aggressively than ignore us. So that, that's my technique. All right. Same question to you, Jaron. What do you think is uh, the most important aspect of Flat Earth we need to get out there? Probably getting to, to be some kind of unit. I just think it's too segmented. and It's not something mm -hmm. I you know, intended or expected from the beginning. Um, you should be able to tell by now who's in this for real, who's not. And it's just something people can't pick up. They still think that 
people have been doing this for three years and making 300 videos and that they're doing it for some nefarious reason or that they don't believe what they're saying. So until we all can operate as um, at least, I mean, you know, Rob's a, a, a Christian and I'm not. We get along great. We sit next to each other at dinner. We talk all the time. So it, it, we have the common goal. We have common beliefs. We both you know, want the world to be a better place. So people need to recognize that. The science side recognizes it, which is really sad. They, they'll back each other up till no end. Um, even if they totally disagree, we just haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. What's been frustrating to me in any kind of a truth or movement, flat earth or otherwise, Ladies is... Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the best time to be a good friend part of our first day to our system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Carefully look for any immediate danger to yourself. Please wait for further instructions over the communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. All right. Isn't science wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> um, I echo both uh, what both Mark and Jaron said. Uh, but in any truth movement, a lot of times what happens is when you start to realize everything's a conspiracy, or at least you get the, to the point where you think everything's a conspiracy, you start to think everything's a conspiracy. Everything. Yeah. You know, it was, we started at 333, see, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> you know, we must be Freemason shills. Um, I think the community needs to first look up the word shill and understand what it actually means. Right. Um, and have some substance behind what you're, if you're going to accuse somebody of something, at least have something to back it up. Don't just make it up. I mean, the, the, what happens too often is it becomes a, an infighting situation and then nothing gets done. We're too busy pointing fingers at the other guy with no substance to prove anything. And, you know, we don't go anywhere. So I, I would say we need to get a lot more unified. And, okay, fine, if we find some rock-solid thing that somebody did that's wrong, fine, maybe we should expose it. But otherwise, you know, why are we fighting each other? <laughs> We've got enough problems, you know? Yeah, look for, look for the person's fruits, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. And if people have been it for a very long time and have been consistent and don't seem to be actually hurting other people, well, probably... They're not a show. <laughs> Bob, uh, you're Probably. the last one to answer the same question, which is, what do you think uh, we should focus on? Would it be activism, or would it? What do you, how should we get well, this message out? What I think we should focus on is exactly the direction I'm trying to take Globusters into, uh, and also FE Core, and we need to get out to the public. You know, some of our results and our experiments that we have found, uh, the laser test, the gyroscope test, the ring laser gyroscope. Uh, the microwave RF tests, uh, we are striving to do them to the very best of our abilities and, um, you know, document them very meticulously. And then after that, we target the educational and professional industries with those results and ask them to either replicate Ladies or... Ladies our response team has located a rectified source of the trouble. All right. Yeah. That was live. Yeah, it was she live. was doing that live every time. Yeah, oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> was everybody like, in the mall right. like, frozen? This whole time? I know that's what I was hoping. Like, yeah, we weird. would like to wonder what Sorry, people in the mall that's okay. were doing. Did yeah. they have to like all stay still? <laughs> were they freaking out? Maybe running. Maybe running. Oh wait, they were running. Maybe, running. Maybe on fire. Okay. okay go ahead, Bob. But anyway, um, yeah. So I think you know once we get all these results collected. Um, we try and get those out to the academic institutions and, you know, have them evaluate what we have done um, and then corroborate that. Um, and that's probably one of the most effective ways that we can actually get the word out um, and also issue a challenge, um, maybe even with some money involved, uh, to some of the uh, higher education institutions. I know that uh, there are currently several challenges out. Uh, not one is... Uh, uh, the $5,000 NASA Eclipse Challenge, uh, where some individuals are releasing all this uh, data about eclipses for the last 50 years, and the challenge is, is to corroborate it and fit it into the heliocentric model. Thus far, nobody has taken that challenge. So these are things that, that you know, are very telling to me because anybody can use an extra $5,000. But uh, So if we can get this information out there and issue challenges, uh, ask them to match what we have found. I think that's one of the best ways we can advance our cause. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm wondering, once they've already said they've located, why is the bell still ringing? But uh, this is the last question, and if you've got questions for any of the panelists, you'll have the opportunity to ask it after this question, so start formulating. Mark, what do you think the 
the best piece of advice you could Wait. give to a brand new flat earther would be. Ladies and gentlemen, Wait. the bell sound you have just heard quite a lot first day alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Didn't we just? Yeah, yeah we went backwards. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. Either the bell lady lied or somebody pulled the alarm again. Yeah, it's probably it's some kids going, oh, we're not stopping this. All right, uh, sorry. The, 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 uh, the best advice for a new flat earther. Somebody a brand new flat earther coming yeah. in. Yeah, some might be here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After sitting yesterday into these, today's presentation. If, yeah, if I was running into a, a flat earther that was, yeah, for the first time, if you're in like a week or a month, uh, first thing I would tell you is don't forget what it took for you to get there. Meaning uh, the, the most common problem I ever run with, with anyone in the flat earth community is that they, once it takes them, so we plant the seed, it gets in their head, and then they flip and they become a flat earther. And then for whatever reason, they forget how long it took them. So if it took them two weeks or two months, they forget that, that entirely. And then all of a sudden, they, they get so full of enthusiasm and they, they rush to their family and say, oh, oh yeah, I convinced these people in two hours. I can convince these people in a cup of coffee. And they just get smacked in the face because, you know, they, they, it's like, they don't understand. It's like, why, why can't you get this? I got it. It's no, 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 you forgot how long it took for you to get there just it's not your job to convince people in two hours it's just plant the seed and let it grow naturally like it did in you there you go that's a good answer Jeremy. yeah i say that uh i tell them to watch if they're watching videos and they hear something that they think might be a fact i mean there's so much wrong information out there now mm. that you know even uh, i'm responsible for i mean when we started doing this you know a lot of people got things wrong or made mistakes and those things have been cleaned up, but you have to, you'd have to be doing your research to see that. I mean, if you uh, think that you know the answer to some question, or uh, if you're going to say that the horizon always rises to eye level, then you need to look into that and see that there's reasons why when you get up um, higher that you are seeing a little bit of a drop, but it's because Ladies the horizon is the uh, apparent. Just heard part of our first alarm system. Please remain where you are. Presently, our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Please wait for further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for any inconvenience. Somebody's mad. Wow. Uh, if David Weiss was here, man, he would be. If David Weiss was here, he would freak out. Uh, so, yes. I yeah, so, it. yeah, it's basically it. Just to make sure you, you know, double check your facts because there's, uh, like I was saying about the horizon, you know, it's an apparent horizon. So if you, you just have to be armed with the right kind of information so that, uh, you're ready to answer questions or to not make more videos saying wrong things and, right. and just kind of further we've all uh, fallen setting into us back. Trap where we've heard something on a video and it sounded right and it did show flat earth to be true and then told that to people and then found out later, well that word doesn't really mean that or that it, Yeah, it, one of the worst things I did was on Globusters, uh, somebody had said that quote by Tesla that said the earth is not a planet, it's a um, realm. A realm. And I mean, I, I just went straight to Globusters and said it, and then I remember saying it, and as I said it, saying, I didn't check that. I right. didn't check that. I got to check it after the check show. Everything. After the show, I spent hours just looking for that. <laughs> Please let me find that damn quote, but it wasn't there. So I mean, right. um, ended up it was, I think that guy Daryl something from Facebook is the one who just kind of made it up. There's a so, lot of memes out there you'll find on uh, social media that are attributed to people, things that people, famous people have said that may bolster flat earth. But you've got to make sure you find yeah, out if those really people sure really it's... said it, because oftentimes they didn't. Right. Yeah. It's too good to be true. Rob Skiba, your answer. Um, there's a, shall I say, ancient proverb that says that a prophet is hailed everywhere except his hometown. And that's true. All, all You can see that in many different cases. Your friends and family, you're probably not going to convince them yourself, because they know you. So what I would say to a, a zealous new flat earther is say look find the best videos that you that were convincing to you and just say hey check this out let somebody else do the hard work you know you can do the follow-up but send them to a video that, that you for somebody that you trust or whatever the, a convincing set of videos and let your friends and family watch those because they're really probably not going to listen to you that's what I would say all right you're the last one to answer the question, Bob. Okay. Well, for me personally, uh, I would have to say do not play by their rules. Meaning 
that when people try and debate you on flat earth, and, and a lot of people, Ladies a lot of us... Ladies and gentlemen, the bell sound you have just heard <laughs> That's is new. part of our first stage election. <laughs> she went on break. <laughs> yeah, she was on break. <laughs> She's like, I'm not amazing. Our response team is on their way to locate the source of the alarm. Did Apparently recorded messages take breaks? <laughs> Apparently, yeah, in America, we just hit the so play button. Further instructions over our communication system. We apologize for anything. In America, we just run and scream. Yeah, we'd, yeah. <laughs> we'd already been back in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, a lot of people want to originally, to go out and talk to people about it. And you will get ridiculous responses like, well, you know, if the earth was flat, it would be daylight all day long, right? Well, that kind of response only indicates that, you know, the person that you're talking to has no idea what the flat earth model is actually about. And so what they're assuming, obviously, is the sun is 93 million miles away. Well, if that was actually true, um, then, you, yeah, you probably would have 24-hour daylight, stuff like that. So they will constantly try and drag you into their mathematics, their model, and say, well, how is this possible? Um, one example uh, that I can give is there's another pilot um, that uh, challenged me to, to navigate the flat Earth <laughs> using the longitude and latitude system, uh, for the globe. And, you know, I'm just, when he asked that, it, it hit me. It's like, oh my God, this is really what your problem is. You're trying to ask me to navigate using a flat earth or, or a global longitude and latitude system, uh, which obviously does not work the same way on a flat earth. And he couldn't get his head around that, obviously. And he still to this day issues that challenge to all flat earthers. But it's very clear that there would be a different type of setup uh, if, if we had one for the flat Earth, uh, possibly like a grid system or something like that. But the bottom line is, is, is you've got to not play by their rules. Remember that when they are speaking, they're always speaking in terms of their model. And you'll find that it very seldom ever applies to the flat Earth. And if you're not on your toes, you'll get sucked right into that argument, and then you'll get your butt kicked. So. Good advice. And another bit of information I just thought of. Remember the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Everyone's seen that? Yep. There was a quote in there that every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Wow, so there's a lot of wings. <laughs> Where's that guy? I didn't so. believe in angels. We've all been promoted. So, now is the opportunity, if you've got a question for anybody here, including me, that you can ask. And the lights are blinding me, but I do believe we still have microphones set up on either side. Anybody? You guys can see Who's got the mic? So, and it'd be well, awesome if, I don't know, if, did they say their name and where they're from? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The <coughs> if you could say who you are and where you're from, I'd like to know. Yes. And I don't know if they did that in the other panels. Yes. Um, I'll need that microphone. Who's? You will. I will. You guys will have to share. <laughs> yeah, so Patricia, just, yeah. you can just um, raise your take hand. On the mic. Yes, in fact, I do know we had one question up front here, though, that they wanted me to ask, so here you go. All right, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to comment on the reporter there, where he was saying that we were always bringing the Bible into this, and I just wanted to say that the people that are pushing this agenda always bring Satan into it. And as Rob showed with Apollo and everything else, it's constantly showing, you know, their Luciferianism. And, and it goes much deeper than just a lie. It's uh, your salvation and where your soul is going to end up. And, you know, and I just wanted to really thank everybody for coming here and telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll make my way back. Oh, no. Oh, here we go again. Well, Cheers. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, this here was a question I got out for Rob. Um, I was going to ask you earlier on, but whenever you guys are going to talk about going on the offensive, is it... Ladies and gentlemen, our response team has located to rectify the source of the trouble. Please be serious. Thank you for your attention and your cooperation. I don't trust you. So what, what research are you currently doing and who are you partnering up with that could really propel uh, this movement forward? You know, somebody who's really mainstream that sort of uh, would partner or co-author co some of your research material. Uh, oh, my goodness. Well, uh, for me, part of the going on the offensive, um, some of you may be aware of this, but Dr. Robert Sengenis, who is behind the movie The Principal, uh, recently... Thank you for your attention and your cooperation. 
All right. I love I love Canada. <laughs> I do. It's not polite anymore. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Robertson Jenis, the guy who did the principle, recently published a book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, 730 page book, uh, mm. in which I mentioned about 180 times. <laughs> so it was like, wow, okay, I guess Good I should job. feel honored by that, but wow. Um, so, you know, at first when something like that happens, you know, you get hurt. I mean, it's like, geez, oh, this sucks. Then I was like, you know what? So I started, yeah, I got, I got his book, and I started looking Ladies through it. Ladies and gentlemen, our response team has located a rescue by the source of the trouble. You may resume your activities. Thank you for your attention and your cooperation. So I start looking through the book. Now, obviously, you know, he claims to be a Christian and claims the Bible is the source for truth. So, you know, there are lots of science type stuff in that book. And I figured, well, you know, I know my gifting. I know my what I the things that I am wired to deal with. So I looked at just the Bible size, about 80 something pages. And I'm like, I'm going to attack that because his eisegesis is unbelievable and pretty easy to refute, in my opinion. And we are scheduled at some point to do a debate. Um, but I went and immediately got the domain isflatearthflatwrong.com. And so my goal is to partner with people that want to help me to demolish this guy's arguments, all of them. Now, obviously, on the Christian biblical side of things, there are guys that I trust Ladies that I would. As for the fire department, you do need to return to your rooms to close your windows as it is fairly smoky outside. <laughs> what? <laughs> Is that is that a real person? I thought that was a recording. It is a real person. I know it is now. It's very smoky outside. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> they don't mean us, do they? Um, until we're chased out. Where's the All right. head of this thing? So, uh, so I. His book is Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. I got the domain is Flat Earth, Flat Wrong. And I want to partner with people on all aspects of it, from the scientific side of things to the biblical side of things. And the people that I trust that I can give a, I have a WordPress site. Ladies and gentlemen, as for the fire department, they do ask that you do close your windows in your room. As it is fairly smoky outside at the moment, thank you for your cooperation. Um, to give them um, author accounts, on my site where they can just rip apart his book, take whatever section that you want, and you know, it's open to all you guys as well uh, to help me out with this, but uh, to partner with other people because you know, he's making the rounds right now. He's, he's one of the big detractors out there. Um, but I'll say this at the same time as saying, you know, he's about 80% on our side, <laughs> you know, when you really get down to it. So I would actually like to see him converted, uh, you know, ultimately. But part of my strategy right now, as far as me going on the offense, offense is, is going Ladies after. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as for the fire department, please do ask that you do return to your rooms and close your windows as it's fairly smoky still outside. Thank you for your cooperation. I want to have so many articles on my website that if anybody looks up Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, all the Google <laughs> searches are going to be from my site, <laughs> not his. Uh, and then what we may be able to do then, if everybody's open to it, if, I, if the idea is that it be an open source uh, place for people to deposit their information, that anybody who's so inclined can take any of that content on there and make a compilation book of their own. Hmm. Uh, to go up against him. So, you know, theoretically, we could have a lot of different books because let's say everybody on the panel here contributes to it and I have my own take on it. Well, I can, if we're all open to that and it's open source, I can say, well, Jaron's got a great, great quote right here. You know, when Jaron says da da da, and I could put together my own book that would have his information. He could do the same thing. Everybody could do the same thing. So we need to start getting stuff out there, you know, more than just our YouTube, I think. And we need to be more um, mindful of the need to unite. Uh, and to go on the offensive, you know, that's my opinion. And do people know that Son Genis is the one from the the movie The Principal? I, well, I think a lot of people do. I don't know. Yeah, you know he, which he, is a great movie if you haven't seen it. It yeah. absolutely destroys the globe. He d he destroys heliocentricity from a scientific point of view, and as well as from a biblical world. Oh, sorry, view. So, yeah, you know, yeah, from both. So, like I said, he's about eighty percent on our side. <laughs> so, you know, but. Uh, I'm not backing down from these people and, and the creation scientists especially. I mean, what they're doing to the text is just, they're just torturing it. So. And we would work with mainstream scientists. Nobody here would be opposed to that. The mainstream scientists are the ones opposed to even considering the idea. Perhaps someday it will happen, but perhaps someday the bell will stop ringing too. <laughs> Maybe not. Patricia, we got a question right here. 
Hi, Sorry. Connie from Red Deer. Um, if the moon is closer, quite yes. a bit closer. As for the fire department, thank you. Ask if you return to your room and close all windows. As it is hazy outside, hazy now. Thank you for your cooperation. If the moon is closer than what we've been told and yes. smaller and goes in a predictable um, path, right, and is within the dome, sure. Why could we not visit it? Is that a question for me or anybody? Oh, anybody. I'll, I'll answer just in the fact that I think that the, the idea of people landing on a ball is not possible. By teaching everybody that it happened, it kind of subconsciously makes us think that we could live on a ball. So, I mean, personally, I think that no matter what the moon is, I don't think it's a big rock in the sky because it kind of breaks, um, you know, a lot of the laws of physics that I would uh, think exist. But then again, it is a celestial item. It's not a terrestrial item. So, I mean, for me, I just, um, I don't think it's someplace you can go because I don't think you can stand on a, you know, a spherical rock unless you were on the very top of it. <laughs> They're telling us right now their problem, even today, is getting through the radiation. You know, the Orion program was the new program that followed the uh, retiring of the space shuttle program. And there's a you know, famous video many of you guys have probably already seen now that NASA put out saying, you know, talking about the Orion project, and saying one of our biggest problems right now is figuring out how to get through the radiation. Of course, anybody with half a brain should be raising their hand and going, uh, why don't you just put on the same jumpsuits and get in the same tin can you did 50 years ago, <laughs> you know, and go clean up Fukushima while you're at it, mm -hmm. if that stuff actually works. Um, and, I, you know, I think Mark's got a great idea in his challenge to, maybe you can talk about the challenge about the vacuum chamber. And the <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm probably going to die in a vacuum chamber. <laughs> so you guys know. Uh, no, I, I tried to... Ladies and gentlemen, oh. as for the fire department, they have asked that you do return to your room and close all windows for the time being. As it is hazy outside, so thank you for your cooperation. And return to your rooms and make your beds. Yeah, no, it's, what's amazing to me is in America, we, that, that would all be pre recorded, and it sounds like they're doing yeah, it, reading it live right. every time. We just hit a play button. The other thing is, we don't actually get closer to the moon. If you notice, when you go up towards it, you don't, it gets further away. Yeah. So it, it isn't like we see it full moon and we start flying in an airplane and we get closer to it. Uh, so it doesn't seem like it's, it's almost like a, what do you call it, a lenticular. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen those things. You walk by and you can kind of see them change. Yeah, yeah. Is that lenticular? Is that the uh, name? I can't remember the name. Yeah, it kind of seems like the moon is, is like that, or the atmosphere is like that, that it's, uh, it's portraying for each person. Um, rainbow. Yeah, like a rainbow. So that's what it seems like to me. Ladies and gentlemen, our response team has located and rectified the source of the trouble. You may resume to your activities. Thank you for your attention and cooperation. Real, real quick, uh, the the challenge I came up with was um, was born out of people that were interviewing me saying, "Is there anything we can show you that would get you to believe in a ball, a globe, a sphere anymore?" And I used to say, that, "You know, put a 4K camera on top of a rocket, you know, and let it run. Don't turn it off. Don't edit anything. But I thought, that's that's going to take forever. No one's ever going to do it." And so I tried to boil it down even simpler. I said, "Let's do something on the ground." Uh, because there, up until now, I don't think there were any tests on the ground. And what we can do is we can create a vacuum chamber, you know, in, in all sorts of different universities. And we should have plenty of spacesuits for the last 50 years because they all work perfectly. None of them ever had a problem. And so I said, okay, give me a NASA suit, put me in it, put me in the chamber, and then pull the lever and, and see what happens. Tell me how I don't die. <laughs> and, no, no, it sounds good in theory. I think you should put them in there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay, yeah, it's also. You videotape it. Yeah, yeah. The other part was I want to go in with somebody else. It's it's not just me. I'd rather have somebody from oh, science would be good. standing next holding to me, hands yeah, holding hands while while this we both go down. <laughs> but but it's true. I, that was my, my the thing I came up with because a fabric suit, a fabric bag of air cannot survive in a vacuum. And I challenge any of you here to even come up with a sci-fi sci explanation. That's how I knew it was going to work because I couldn't even come up with anything in movies and television. I could not imagine the technology that's supposedly in that backpack that stops a suit from going tight as a snare drum and bursting. And why that technology isn't used for so many other things oh, yeah. for all of us here on yeah. Earth. Even the way they say the suits can protect from micrometeors when yeah. on the ISS, they're out doing spacewalks. Yeah. Let's have that stuff on our cars on the exterior, on our children's bicycle helmets. I right. mean, doesn't make any sense. Great. But you were also talking, speaking of the bell, but having like different things in there, like a balloon, Wait. so we see the balloon expand in water. Ladies and gentlemen, our response team has located and rectified the source of the trouble. You may resume to your activities. Thank you for your attention and cooperation.
operation. Thank you. But yeah, you were talking about putting a balloon in there so it expands the water so it boils. And yeah. Well, oh yeah, the three the tests. Bell. Yeah, the bell because the bell to, won't to make any sound. To verify that they are in fact in a vacuum chamber. Right. You do that test, those three tests first. Then. Well, have them, them in there with those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it can't be faked. Well, you can't have, can't fake all three. And and you could those three things would cost you all what four dollars. It's easy to do. Um, we're going to go to you, Eddie, with the microphone. But first, to the back, the gentleman who has the microphone with your question. Right. I'm Whitney. I'm from Wade Wait. School. A Wait. Louder, this is no, no. Is, she's Wait. Wait. Ladies and gentlemen, our response team is located to rectify the source of the trouble. You may resume to your activities. Thank you for your attention and cooperation. I, I, I will hand it to Canada. They are thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely thorough. My name is Whitney. I'm from here as well. Uh, this is for Jaren. Um, I've gotten to talk to just about everyone there so far, except for you, Jaren. Uh, my question for you is more along the line of your freedom of information request to NASA and the development on that. I haven't heard anything on that lately. You may have put it up on your YouTube channel or something, but I haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't. Finally, they, it took a month till I got the money back from my bank, and then I was able to submit the payment again, and it went through this time. <clears throat> then she told me uh, July, uh, July 17th, she said she would have it by the 30th. I never got any calls, and then just uh, day before yesterday, she called and told me to make the final payment that they have the video. So uh, as soon as I make that payment, then they should ship it. So we'll see what uh, we get, because I had to send them a hard drive. So uh, there's something on there, according to her. Can you let everyone know what that? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's going to be all released uh, to archive.org and then also on my channel in its completion, whatever I get. Uh, my name is James from uh, Calgary, Alberta. Uh, just a question for everybody. Uh, when you first started discussing Flat Earth, uh, have you ever had any close friends or family, maybe extended family, that have reacted badly uh, to this? Um, maybe got uh, aggressive, overly hostile, um, or just cut ties with you, and how have you dealt with it? Uh, I, I started out by saying, if you want to see somebody get in touch with their inner psycho, <laughs> just mention that you're looking into it. And you will see sweet old ladies go bat crap crazy right in front of you. Your grandmother that was like the sweetest woman ever, like, go insane. And I've seen, like, wow, people that I never in a million years would have imagined losing it go crazy in front of me. And, you know, that's what made me think there is something on a spiritual level here like it's it's it, i can't explain it uh in any rational sense why somebody would go with that berserk in front of me mm. just at the mere mention of hey you know i'm looking into this flat earth thing yeah i've i've lost friends you know for the most part my family has been really cool with it because uh, they've been along with me on the journey and like i <laughs> said during one of my presentations where I sh i'm showing my dad stuff who was also a pilot so yeah i got him going with the attitude indicator i'm like dad you know it's been about 20 years since i've flown i think i remember how the you know, can you explain how the attitude indicator works again and he went through the whole thing so i popped that on him and he's like yeah, that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> um so you know my immediate family has been pretty cool but uh yeah i've lost good friends and, and other people have just Taken off. Yeah. You haven't had any, but anything so much like that um, that I can think of. Nobody got real upset. Although I do think a reason why people would is, you know, everything changes in your life. Uh, you know, your parents uh, you know, pass away, your grandparents passed away, you change schools, you change homes, and the one thing that never changes is the ball earth. So it's kind of like that baby blanket for people that, you know, it's just the one thing that they thought they'd never have to even question because it's been a ball since you were a born. So I think that could be a reason why people lose it because that's kind of all they have to hold on to, you know. Um, I most of my family was okay with it or neutral with it because I'm a pretty strange guy sometimes anyway. <laughs> Still somewhat eccentric, but I did have a cousin who I'd only talked to maybe twice a year write me an email 
and just lace me with profanity. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the bleep, 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 bleep. It's like, and, and I hadn't written her in, in probably, I don't know, a year at least. And, and that was her opening line. And I <laughs> save it now as sort of a little inspiration. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I'm also saving it for if we run into it. We haven't spoken since, and I have to go through her twin sister. To, to, but yeah, I mean, it does happen from time to time. I told my sister and my brother, my sister said, very interesting, I know you're intelligent, so there must be something to this, but I don't have time to look into it, we've all heard that. My brother said, have you become, quote, a crazy Christian, unquote, and are you a Holocaust denier who hates Jews? And I went, what about anything I said, Nizle. Right. <laughs> and you've known me all my life, and you, and it was weird response. But that's a taught the response. I mean, that a is a response. trained response. Exactly. Yeah. Patricia, we have another question here. Yes. Uh, Lynn from Idaho. Uh, you know, I, I'm a flat earther, but if you look at the night sky, there's a ton of heliocentric model evidence. I mean, you got this, the moon that looks 3D, like a sphere with the craters. You got, you know, phases of the moon shining to the sun like it's reflecting off it. You got planets that look like they're orbiting with us around the sun. You have Jupiter moons, you got comets with solar wind tails. So either whoever created the flat earth decided to put all this in place to mess with our heads, or hologram technology came along at some point, although look at all the flaws to it, so they had the technology to do it, but they didn't do it perfect. Or what? Help me out here. So. Who wants to Who wants that it? one? Want me to jump? I think some of the things you said may be true, and some might be. I, I see. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, you call it he, heliocentric, uh, you know, evidence. But at the same time, why? You know, who? The saying I like to throw out to people is, uh, yeah, God created the sun and the moon, but it was NASA that told you what they were and how far they were away, and, and what. Then you see. Yeah, and what's happening in the sky? So you know, I I, I generally jump back to you know what we can do now. Uh, you know, like 2001, A Space Odyssey, I challenge anyone to go in with a Blu-ray and, and look at that moon when they're heading towards the moon. It's gorgeous. It's flawless. And we did that movie back in the 60s. We're talking about powers and technology. It's way, way beyond us. And if it was all heliocentric proof, I think that uh, then they would have said it was heliocentric from the start. But they obviously didn't because no one had taught it to them when they were you know, in kindergarten. Right. So I think we are all very conditioned mm -hmm. to uh, look at things on that kind of spherical model and then everything makes sense in the planets. And um, But I myself struggle with, I watch Jupiter and its moons, you know, almost every night. And it is interesting. But then again, I've never been shown, you know, enough evidence to say that Jupiter is bigger than a basketball or bigger than a, um, you know, 10 foot or 100 foot. I don't know how big it is. They tell me it's 100 times as big as the Earth, and I think that that's ridiculous, and I don't think there's evidence for it. So until they prove those things to me, I, I just look at it as a light in the sky, and it's got um, you know, four little lights that seem to circle it or follow it. And what happens up there doesn't really make what we're standing on like what's up there. True. It's way different. I mean, look at all the life that's here, and we know that there's even NASA, but there's no life anywhere else. So it's a very big difference between this place where... Well, I feel the Earth is the biggest thing that there is by far. You know, it's, there's nothing even close to the size of the Earth. Um, Except Elon Musk's ego. Right? There you go. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> and also, you have to remember that um, the heliocentric cosmology is the new kid in town. Uh, before that, every culture on Earth, going back as far as recorded history, um, has had the cosmology as a flat, stationary Earth. Um, all of the, you know, we talked about uh, some of the instruments that were found, like the Antikythera device and, and astrolabes and stuff like this, that absolutely show that this, these predictions and, and this cosmology was just as viable on a flat Earth as it is on the heliocentric model. It's only been the last 500 years, basically, that they've been back engineering it and also making up a lot of their own facts as they go along. Uh, you know, like, like putting the, the sun out to 93 million miles. But before it was that, uh, it was much further, and it's also been much closer. So it's been a trial and error process for the heliocentrists also. Any other questions from the audience? 
Hi, my name is Jessica Mason. I'm from Grand Prairie, Alberta, five hours west from here. Um, my question is, for a lot of us are on social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and as you know, they are censoring big time. So posts are getting taken down, people's YouTube pages are disappearing. I mean, I'm a nobody and my posts are deleted all the time. So do you guys have any alternative media sources that we can go to when this all shuts down? Mm. Very good question. Yeah. I uh, I think that's probably very much on all of our minds. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, you put a lot of time and effort into the content and trying to build your subscription base and everything else, and like at any second, it could all go away. Uh, I, don't, I have yet to find the alternative yet. I am still looking myself because each one that I have been told about has its problems also. Uh, so I don't have that solution, but what I've been doing with my subscribers is saying, look, I'm creating an email list. Get on my email list because if one day you go and find my YouTube channel is gone, that's about the only way I'm going to be able to contact most of you. <laughs> you know, So th that's what I'm taking steps to do right now, but I don't know, maybe you guys know of some alternatives, but I think that's on all of our minds right now. now it also seems like YouTube's got the handle on... Uh video players that actually play well in a browser. And it's just, I don't know about everybody else, I can't get videos to play anywhere else. It seems like, so if you want a decent running video with, uh, that works well, it's like YouTube's the only place. Um, but if anybody has any sites the only game in town, and they're also playing with it, as Mark's pointed out before, yeah. with yeah. the search. I'd also like to say that it don't don't think, and I know the Alex Jones thing that happened just as we were coming up here, you know, probably weighing on all your minds. But don't forget that that was an individual. And Flat Earth is an idea. I mean, technically, we could all die in a plane crash tomorrow. No, not going to happen. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, Flat Earth keeps going. I mean, Flat Earth is a massive, massive idea. You try to shut down Flat Earth at this point, it would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, I have to quote real quick the, um, the Google uh, YouTube engineer that finally, after he left Google for a certain amount of time, his disclosure agreement uh, lapsed and he get, did an interview. And, what, and literally, out of all the things he could have picked in terms of topics, he was asking how search engines work and how things are recommended. And he goes, look, when somebody watches 20 Flat Earth, flat earth videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? We're going to recommend that. Uh, we are still this secret cash cow for YouTube. Because a lot of people, a lot of people go into it, and I'll finish with this. When the adpocalypse, if you guys didn't know what that was, when YouTube wanted to get some of their bigger sponsors back, and they were going after some of the channels that were out there and shutting them down, Flat Earth did not take much of a hit uh, in comparison. Yeah, there were a few channels that, that took hits here and there, but, you know, I can't speak for any of you guys here, but I lost no videos from from YouTube and most of the people I talked to didn't lose any videos. Flat Earth is bigger than just a, a small bias that's out there. When people come against us, it's it's not that easy to pin down. I can't even imagine if I was even working for YouTube how I would take out Flat Earth. There's too many ways to sneak it in. But anyway. Keep using the social media that you've got yeah. until otherwise uh, informed and use it a lot. If, if, no matter what you do, just try to talk about it. I, I think and we, the whole Fight Club thing, you know, don't talk about it. I really think we should try to talk about it as much as possible. But of course, know who you're talking to and yeah. approach them a way that would make sense to them. And yeah, then don't, if you're shut down, don't waste a lot of time with them. Don't engage in fighting with them. You can never convert anyone by fighting. Yeah. Don't, yeah, do, one more real quick thing. Don't pick a fight if you don't have to. That's, that's the Fight Club reference, which is, look, if you know they're going to come at you, if you, yeah, fine, if you're in, in the mood for a fight, sure, go ahead. But don't, don't sacrifice friends and family and coworkers just because you, you want to ham fist it. You know, show some delicacy when you're doing it. Sometimes being right is something that you know. You yeah. don't have to force it down someone else's. Patricia, we have another question? Yes, and then a, there's a gentleman here, and Eddie, you wanted to ask the question too, right, eventually? Yeah, All right. Great, this is kind of a mix. Uh, it's Rob from Windsor here. Thanks, guys, for answering all the questions that you have. Uh, so, Shambhala? Right? We have the North Pole, we have Santa Claus lives there, maybe, and the testimony of Admiral Byrd going there. What's your kind of thoughts on that? And then going into the lights, or sorry, the, the stars and the sun being as for times and seasons of what's to come and what is happening now, your thoughts on astrology 
uh, with the occult and new age and just all that kind of wrapped up. Yeah, not to, not to. No, no, that's okay. Anyone? And I would love to go north. I mean, I, I think that if anybody can ever orchestrate some sort of a, uh, you know, journey up there, that would be the best thing that we could do. I don't think you'd make it. I mean, I'm not saying that they would kill you. I just don't know if logistically it could happen. But, it, yeah, I think it's a huge importance to to see. Were you talking to um, Bob earlier about the idea of the magnetic mountain? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, I think that's highly possible, you know, that uh, there is some sort of Mount Maru um, there at the center. That you know, That's why they don't have flights that go right over it. They seem to go uh, askew. Uh, they don't let anybody within a certain range there. So uh, I think we've got to get there. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, you know, for a while, all of our attention was on Antarctica, what's going on, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on down there for sure. Uh, but the temperature difference between the south and the north is dramatic. I mean, it's just crazy how different it is. And the north is way more reasonably accessible. I'm sure that there are probably some sort of government restrictions and things. But in, in terms of climate and other things, it's a lot more accessible. And when you start, when, well, at least when I started to look into the whole Rupus Negra, Mount Meru, sides of the north, Mount Zion, whatever you want to call it, this thing that's supposedly in the center of the north, um, it gets very interesting. In fact, most of us went to schools that had the Mercator map hanging in our classroom. And if you look into Mercator and read what he wrote to John D, Mercator wrote this letter to John D describing in quite a bit of detail about this magnetic lodestone mountain uh, with a circumference of a 33 miles, I think it was, or is a diameter, I forget, of 33 miles, uh, that has four rivers going out from it with four island-like small continents around it. And, uh, you know, many ancient cultures had an understanding of this place and regularly wrote about it. And when you see that that writing in, uh, about this place, it goes all the way into the 1940s with uh, Admiral Byrd, I think there's something to it. You know, and I, I'm now, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I, I am now. What? Oh, uh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I am, like, Getting way cold. more interested in the north than I am in the south. Yeah. And, Good. and I think if we can, if there's any way to get there, I would, you know, look, if we can at least get to the, to the land mass, that's cool enough because the rivers are pretty wild and the description of the four uh, land I uh, islands there are pretty amazing. And I would like to get as far on the land to go see the Whirlpool because there's something like 400 or 500 miles across Whirlpool at the center. It, it, that the, the mountain is in the center of this Whirlpool. Wow. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. What about the stars and the signs and seasons? I would actually just like to get into Aurora Borealis really quick. With that, with the whirlpool, with Aurora being a light and Bor being a hole, like Borealis, um, light coming from a hole, what's up with that? Um, okay, uh, how many of you guys have seen the video that I did with Andy Hoy and his tabernacle model? Anybody raise your hand? Anybody see that? Uh, if you haven't, you should look through my video list for the video that I did with a guy named Andy Hoy. And now, mind you, the information came at, to me at a time when I was really beat down, like, you know. When I first got into this with Mark in April 2015, I started blogging like crazy and writing and putting up what eventually became testingglobe.com. By August, you know, every the world's coming after me, attacking me. I got sciatica. My wife's father, my father-in-law is in our living room dying of cancer. It was a rough season. And I said, screw this, I'm done. I put up Phil Collins, I don't care anymore, on every page of my website. I put up, <laughs> I put up the Phil Collins video, I don't care anymore. I was like, forget it, I I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, then I get this letter from an atheist saying, how dare you, you know, and it was actually an atheist that made me put it back up again because of how much it meant to him. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. What was the original question? <laughs> or Aurora Borealis. Oh, Aurora Borealis. So this, I'm in the middle of all this, like, I'm, in, I'm way down low, and I get this package in the mail by the, from this guy, Andy Hoy, and usually it's something like that. It goes in the, I'll get to it later pile, which I almost never get to. I finally opened it up and looked at it, and he had these very detailed, he's an engineer and he's a Hebrew scholar, and he had spent time in Israel studying the tabernacle in the wilderness. And as an engineer, he's saying the usual rectangular box that is usually depicted as the ancient tabernacle doesn't work from an engineering perspective, nor does it work from a linguistic when you look at the text and everything. So he went back to the text and looked at it in Hebrew, and as an engineer, he said, wait a minute, everybody's assuming you connect the long curtains 
on the long ends. The, the, the text just says connect them at the, at the ends. Everybody assumes the long ends, and when you do, you get re rectangular box. But he says the text doesn't demand that, so I wonder what, what would happen if I connected it at the short ends. And when he did, he ended up with a six-story high circular dome tent, within which is the Holy of Holies, that has uh, curtains set up with cherubim on them. Uh, and if that is a blueprint of something that Moses was shown in heaven, I believe he may have been shown what I call the Yahua terrarium, or this place that we're living in. In which case, the throne would be right above it, and the curtains in the tabernacle represent what we call the Aurora Borealis. Isn't, isn't that exactly what that cosmos into, into Pluidiosis uh, from Christian topography? Oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the Egyptian monk yeah. cosmos. Yeah, he said something along those, thing, yeah, right? along those lines. So, you know, I don't know, but it, you know, it seems rather interesting that we may have this thing called Rupus Negra, Mount Meru, the sides of the north, Mount Zion, right under the location of the throne, and we have this curtain, and if you've ever seen the northern lights, and we're hoping to, <laughs> in the next couple of days, maybe, uh, it's, it looks like these wavy curtains up there in the sky, so. That is a fantastic the answer. Of Oz, with the cur behind the curtain, lies the yeah. truth, the man with all the power. There's a lot of these things hmm. that are connected. But yeah, look up that video. I did a whole thing on it with Andy Hoy. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you first for coming to Edmonton, everyone who came. Thank you. Welcome. Please come back next year. It's super fun. Yeah. I'm from Edmonton. My name's Grace. Um, I just, more than a question, I sort of have a comment. I'd like to go back to what you were talking about earlier about how to talk to someone who has never thought about Flat Earth before. And, um, I'm nervous. I'm going to lean on you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous. <laughs> um, I think that Mark was right when he suggested going after first NASA and the American space program, because I think that's what happened to me. And regardless of your politics, if everyone could just kind of take a deep breath and go, huh, and forget who you like and don't like and what the media especially has told us, because as you've pointed out and as most of us know, we are being lied to. And I think that's something we can really all agree on. Like, that's a really good jump off point almost is to, to point that out that, yeah, we're definitely being lied to about some things, right? Mm. So um, with, with NASA, for example, I saw with my own eyes and heard, watched a video where NASA, in a compilation with Obama actually, um, admitting that we cannot leave Earth's lower orbit. Yeah. So if we can't leave Earth's lower orbit, and the moon isn't in Earth's lower orbit apparently, how did we go? And if it is within Earth's lower orbit, then we're being lied to about where it is exactly, right? And the size of it, too. And that's where I think the moon is really interesting. And there's other reasons, too, of course. When it comes to, uh, let's say, Trump, for example, he stood with um, Buzz Aldrin beside him, and he said, and Buzz made all kinds of weird faces. I don't know if you've seen that video. Mm -hmm. Anyway, regardless of what you think of Buzz Aldrin, even, um, Trump said that it's um, going to be difficult for people to understand why we're creating a space program when there is no space. And you can Google it, Trump says there is no space, what, regardless of what you think of him. And so he also said, oh, I forgot off the top of my head, I'm sorry. But it's interesting, if you pay attention, I think, just to what we're being told on that level, it shows that we're right. We are right about being lied to. It's a good place to start, I think, right? And if there is a reason why we haven't lived or left Earth's lower orbit, what is it? And if it is a dome and you're talking to scientists, suggest something like plasma. Get them thinking, like, what could it be? It doesn't have to be, and that was the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that I don't think you have to be religious to believe that we're being lied to or that there's a chance that we, there is a dome or something above us, something. Call it a firmament, call it a dome, call it plasma, call it whatever you want. But there's something. There's some reason why we can't leave Earth's lower orbit. What is it? Right? So, I don't know. Just a thought. Just a way to maybe get the ball rolling. That's all. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You have a beautiful okay. voice, by the way.
Thank you so much, Patricia. You are so gorgeous. No one would believe your age ever, ever, ever. <laughs> okay. I do want to respond to, to one comment that you made, um, you know, about why is it that we can't get out there. And a, a very interesting news item came up, I don't know, about two or three years ago uh, from the University of Colorado uh, and then was also verified by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And in this article, they describe that they have found a Star Trek-like shield um, about 7,000 miles above the Earth. And they say that it, it is so bizarre that it, it seems like it's an absolute solid object. And they have no explanation for it, but they're saying, well, this has got to be what's, what's protecting us from the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, but yeah, just the fact that that came out by, by CSU and then was verified by MIT, that in and of itself should really make people uh, question things. Yeah. So, Hi, my name is Ellie from St. Albert. And I'm just wondering, with all the different space stations that we've had up there, the American, the Russian, the international, do you guys know of any experiments that have benefited mankind? It's <laughs> a great question. A lot of money, and uh, no. And you'd think that these actors that they hire, or astronauts, whatever you want to call them, you'd think that they would have something to say when they're asked, what experiments are you doing? And every time they just say the word science, over and over again, and it can, can't even make up one. So it's pretty, pretty pathetic. But I think that's you know, based off what she said, too. You know, that's where we need to start with people, point those things out. NASA says that uh, every astronaut is one of 4,000 applicants. I mean, you should, we should be expecting so much higher of a caliber than we're getting. Yeah. It seems like they play with toys on, on the ISS, really. The gorilla suits, guitar, water, water ping pong every water ping time. Pong, um, showing us how toilets work and how you wash your hair. Things that would amuse yeah. children, stuffed animals flying in the air, and continually growing lettuce for some strange reason. Yeah, John and I always make that joke that you can look it up, just Google it, and then change the time that you're searching. Go back to 1990 to 95 or 95 to 2000. And they're always, uh, they grew lettuce on the ISS for the first time. The and the it's the same thing over and over again. So. A few different times. Yeah. And so. they present it every time as if, um, I mean, it might start to get you to believe in the Mandela effect, as if it's brand new information. Right. And I think that's how they're, like the book 1984, when they change the truth yep. and then throw the old story down the memory hole where it would burn and disappear. That's how they're tricking everybody who's not paying close attention. Just, uh, just saying a totally different story, and everyone just believes it's true. And that's why it's really important for us, all at Flat Earth, it's not just who's here, to remain vigilant and keep track of these, these right. lies. Yeah. Yeah, take screenshots and things like that, because yeah. you're absolutely right. That's what scares me about the Mandela effect. I don't think that the Mandela effect it, itself is true. I think it's just bad memories. But then what they're going to do with that is once everybody's convinced it's just our bad memories, then they start removing things from history, and the answer is going to be, oh, we remembered it wrong. Right. So that's the plan, is um, by making us think, oh, sex in the city, sex and the city, how do we spell Fruit Loops, people are going to get used to the fact, oh, it's just our bad memories, and then when they start plucking things off the Internet, uh, it's going to be our default answer is, oh, I guess yeah. I just remember that yeah, wrong, so be careful. They already went to Mars in 15 years. They could just put that in the news. They're, They're not on Mars? Oh. They're little <laughs> robot cars. Yeah. It's already working on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. There is no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. Speak a little louder. There is Speaking no dark the side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got it. Okay, my, my question happens to deal with... I haven't done it. I got lazy. I forgot. I don't know what the reason is. I've always wanted to get back into it. But I'm seeing, and I believe, and I accept. I don't know what to think, because, again, I haven't done my homework. What's the deal, what they're telling us, the moon didn't start glowing until 1977? <laughs> I've never heard that. What Nobody? Well, I, I know where you're going with this, but no, the, the moon, this was kind of, this was talked by a few other people, and that is, you know, wh when did we all of a sudden notice that the moon was glowing? You know, beforehand, like the entire Apollo space program, I think I know where you're going with this, uh, which is the entire, uh, when you go up and look at the moon in a full bright moon, you know, tonight or whenever it's full, it's really, really bright. Uh, extremely bright, white, white. In fact, you can't even look at it with night vision. And yet, when you look at all the photos and movies of Apollo, it's this dark, dark, ashen gray. 
and we'll take it one step further in that, that picture that Rob shows where the, the moon is transiting in front of the Earth, the, the color's all wrong. Right. The, it's, it's completely off. Uh, well, when the astronauts are on the moon, supposedly, why isn't this just this crazy bright white light shining out? Oh, yeah, it be, yeah. should be totally overexposed. That's interesting, too, because uh, what you see in the... I've looked into Galileo's drawings. Uh, they say before they had a telescope that they couldn't see the markings on the moon. There's no drawings of it from... 1400, 1200, so where, why wouldn't you be able to see what we can clearly see with our eyes? Someone changed the light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's no drawings of it. I mean, they didn't really, and in fact, they thought it was like, uh, they didn't even think there was any kind of craters or anything on it until uh, they got the telescope. So that story's never jive with me again, you know, my opinion of history, so I don't really put much to it, but. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, another question? Yes. I find it really fascinating. Uh, uh, I've heard so many times <clears throat> Barack Obama scoff people who believe in flat earth mm -hmm. and also Hillary Clinton saying so many times we've hit the glass ceiling. Yeah. I find it fascinating for people who don't believe it. Why would they use those kinds of terms? Another thing I want to bring up is my relatives prefer to be entertained than educated. That scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think we all have relatives like that. <laughs> yeah, let me throw in a quick story because I know we've got seven minutes left. Uh, the, to that to that point, I went uh, to a, a party and they wanted to watch a movie, and they sat down and they, it's like they had a choice between uh, JFK, the movie from Oliver Stone, and Serenity. And I asked them which one they wanted, and almost everybody who had, had already seen Serenity, which was a space movie, an entertainment movie, and JFK almost no one had seen. And I said, and I could recommend it. I was going, look, JFK is a brilliant, you know, brilliant film. Why you you got to watch this, at, you know, at least once. And the the reply back was almost unanimously was, we don't want to learn anything. We want to be entertained. Mm. And it was like, oh, there's a killing me. Before we said. Why are you always looking into things? Sometimes I just don't want to learn. Yeah. First and last date there. <laughs> I get another question. Very different kind of people. Yeah. Hi, my name's things. Brian from Red Deer, Alberta. So my question is, is there any credence to this pole shift that you keep hearing about? I guess if there was flat, there wouldn't be, but there is obviously magnetic fields up north. We just automatically hand the microphone to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Bob. Okay, well, my answer to that is, is there could be a pole shift magnetically. And in fact, we are witnessing this happening at this very moment. Uh, Earth's magnetic fields are radically changing, and in fact, to, to the degree that a lot of airports are actually having to change, re, rename their uh, runway numbers uh, because the magnetic bearing is changing. And I find this interesting because um, we're also seeing some really radical changes, you know, weather-wise around the world. And um, one thing that, that I really find interesting is the whole story of uh, the rapture and also how this time around, you know, when the world ends, that it's going to basically be happening in fire. Well, if you follow the electric universe model and understand how this plasma actually works, if, if magnetically we do actually change this polarity, um, it could very well cause that thing that I was talking about today, about you know what is it that determines up from down to actually change over, um, not and and that could be the catalyst that could cause things to actually start going up, and it would also wreak havoc with the plasma system. So I, I would say that it is possible. We are definitely seeing some very interesting signs regarding that. Uh, not to mention all the, the heat waves. Of course, a lot of that could also be brought about by other uh, artificial manipulation of the weather. But uh, it, it certainly right now has enough evidence that uh, I would be watching it very carefully. Just in the interest of time, one more here. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm from Edmonton in area. Uh, I just was wondering what your guys' theories are with eclipses. And like from the Bible standpoint, like in Egypt during the plagues, there was darkness. So was that an eclipse? And what are, what is an eclipse? Yeah. Um, you know, in the Genesis account, it says he makes two great lights. One to rule day, one to rule the night. It doesn't say he makes a great light and a rock with this reflector. Uh, we see in other places where it says that the moon will not give her light. So, you know, from my perspective, from a biblical perspective, that these are they're some sort of light-generating objects that are up there. 
and if they can be turned on, I suppose they could be turned off. Now, eclipses are different. It's a scenario where something is going in front of something else. Um, now, I had a, I don't know what else to call it. It was like, a, it was more realistic than a dream. I don't know if it was an open vision or what it was. I don't know, but it was very uh, vivid. I was in this dream vision, whatever you want to call it. I was on a lake doing a long distance test with, with the P900. <laughs> And uh, there was this really loud boom, like this crazy loud, deep boom, and the sun shut off. <laughs> like, it's just like, boom, the sun just turned off. And it was beyond pitch black in my vision. And so, in that, you know, what does it mean? I have no idea. Maybe, you know, I ate something before I went to bed. I don't know. But it was a tangible darkness, and that's the same type of darkness that's described during the time of the Exodus. So, you know, what does that mean? I don't know. You know, if they are just light bulbs that were turned on at the day four of creation, then they could be turned off too. Other question? Actually, I have a thousand questions, but I'll <laughs> keep this short and simple. <laughs> um, my name is Bonnie. I'm from Sherwood Park. And I just wanted to let the people in the Edmonton area know that um, I really want to start having meetups here. So, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Thank you. So Mark has graciously um, offered to put the notices on his channel yep. so that everyone will know um, when and where the meetups are scheduled. And we hope to have a great turnout. And we hope to do this at least once a month. Cool. So hope to see you all soon again. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Excellent. May I have time for one more here? Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, kind of following up with the last question, I just wanted to know if you guys believe in the sun simulators. The sun simulators? Yeah. Simulator. Yeah, I've seen video of uh, one of them that they have, the hexagon looking one, um, which is pretty crazy because we know that they can put up things at 8,000 pounds on balloons. Um, so, you know, that's why I've had a couple people try and offer to either buy my way down to Antarctica, they, and they're Globers. They really want me to go to Antarctica and watch this 24-hour sun. And for me, it's just not worth the money because I don't think it would be proof because they put you in one spot with a bunch of people at a camp, and it's, if I see a light just go around my head, I still am standing on a frozen tundra that's getting six months of sun, and I'm not sure that that's enough when I've seen that sun simulator. NASA's got two patents, I think, for it. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's... Uh, it's definitely, they're not getting patents for fake things, I don't think, and I definitely think they have it. What for? I have no idea. Uh, they've got all kinds of telescope stuff down there in Antarctica, too, that's crazy that we don't get to see very much of huge things, you know, 10-story right. high reflector mirrors, and who knows what they're doing with that stuff. Does anyone else on the panel believe in them? I don't know enough about it. Yeah, I've seen some of the same stuff that he's I referring think they to. Exist by what I've seen. Yeah, I believe definitely. I've seen the patents that you can. I mean, right. you can just look but them up. Of course, up. we all know that patents can be fake. Well, be yeah. fair enough. Right. But certainly, someone somewhere has been thinking about this and right. took the time to draw up schematics and so go through. Why? Yeah. What are they planning on using it for? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, especially if they believe global warming and all that, why would you want to add another sun? <laughs> Melting at you know? some parts of Antarctica no. because something is buried there. I mean, these are things you start thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Also, look, look how far lighting technology has, has come. Um, yeah. For example, Jen and I both have these um, 6300 lumen flashlights. And when, and when you look at the, the bulbs of them, the, the LED bulbs, there's almost nothing to them. It, it's crazy. So... When I look at that and I think of if you had an entire panel of them the size of, you know, something very large uh, and a good power source behind it, you literally could create something like the sun. So I don't think it's far-fetched out of our technology at all. No. Yeah, it's about as big as that screen over there, the one that I've seen, um, hexagon-shaped and, and probably 100 bulbs on it. And, you know, I've never seen it turned on, but I've seen the, yeah. the light. Yeah. And there's some movie, and Mark's a movie expert, and I always forget titles and quotes of movies. Maybe you'll remember where there are people, and they have a, there's a sun simulator, and that one doesn't work, and they have to go to another area to, to live. Ring a bell? Uh, no. <laughs> it's Sorry. In movies, and oftentimes things in movies have something to do with something that's really mm. happening. Patricia, I think we have time for one more, and I'll be right here. Be the last. last question. Hi, friends. My name's Michael. Um, 
I'm sure most can agree that uh, uh, the spell of Hollywood has a big influence on the collective uh, masses uh, and being our neighbors across south as opposed to down south. Uh, with Trump pushing out his uh, uh, space force, to me, just oh, proceeding no. with the generation kind of growing up now, seeing these space indoctrination movies, uh, just my speculation, I'm sure there's many agendas, but uh, to me it's just a military recruitment scam because That's, hey, yeah. they, can, they can never use enough meat shields to any military, whatever country, but I just wanted to know your guys' take of what the uh, Space Force uh, yeah, which I is bollocks that's, in my opinion. That's a good one, Dan. I, I think you're 100% right. So that's what, what better way to get, you know, teenagers and, and college uh, kids to be interested in joining the military. So they want to go into the Space Force. Oh, sorry, we, you got to start out here. You gotta, we don't have a place there, but we have somewhere in the Marines. Or So I think you're absolutely right. That seems yeah. like it to me. Uh, that, that seems to me to be a perpetuation. If, if the Werner von Braun deathbed uh, testimony is true, then, you know, he said it. It's all based on a lie. But there's always this, another excuse for space-based weaponry. And creating a space force, that it's a militarized thing, you know, that's what we're talking about. We're, the Ronald Reagan's Star Wars, right? From my perspective, biblically speaking, uh, we see that in the end times, the sky is going to open like a sky dome. <laughs> and it tells you, like, that the sky is going to roll away like a scroll. Uh, and that uh, Yeshua is coming back on a horse. And Revelation 19.19 19 says that all the nations of the world have gathered together to make war with the one coming on the horse. So for me, when I look at this whole agenda for space-based weapons, that's what makes the most sense. That they, they're trying to find a way to make war with God. And if we believe we're in the end times, that day may be approaching when the sky dome opens up and they want to be ready for it. I read that former astronaut, in quotes, Scott Kelly, said when Trump started talking about Space Force originally, said it was a, quote, dumb idea. That's interesting. So they're creating their own opposition with asking Scott Kelly to say that. Another thing might be the alien invasion that you want to have your, even though it's, even though it's fake, you have your fake military yeah. team to, to combat it. And, and that was what Werner Von Braun, he said the last card, is the, the alien last alien. card is aliens, and remember, it's all a lie. Yeah. Do, do any of us think that the last card will be played in our lifetime? Yes. yes. Yeah. Probably sooner than we think. Yep. Right. Well, we're aware, so we'll at least be able to tell our neighbors, don't believe. <laughs> don't do what they tell you to do. But we'll be the last ones. So. So that's it. It's been fun. And we all have a new appreciation for bells, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Thanks for putting up with all thanks, of that. Thanks to everybody in Edmonton. You guys were great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Give it up for the panel, guys. Give it up. <laughs> Patricia Steer, Mark Sargent, Jaron Campanella, Rob Skiba, Bob Nodell, Emmanuel Lakanga. Big Matt Long. And of course, the guy that put this all together for us and did a lot of work. And uh, I can tell you this. Give credit, give a round of applause to his wife and children first. Because that's a lot of work for Rachel and the kids to, to do this. But, oh, there you are. I was looking for you. Robbie Davidson. I got it. Thank you. I just wanted to say real quick, I just want to close it up by really thanking a lot of people that need to be thanked for this incredible event that, take, that took place in my home city, Edmonton, Alberta. And really making history in Canada is a huge deal to me, but also doing this for the community and hopefully everyone's had a great time, learned things, maybe been inspired to go to that next level. One of the themes for 2018 with FEIC is we're going to take it to the next level and we are taking it to the next level. But for me, I want to truly thank God because nothing basically has come without him. And I'm so incredibly thankful. My beautiful wife, honey, I love you. And you're so incredibly not just supportive, but honestly, this conference and the things that you see with Celebrate Truth and the things I do would not happen if it wasn't for her working behind the scenes and getting so many things done, accomplished. <laughs> Thank you.
We're truly blessed with a beautiful family. And for me, having my daughter and my new baby boy, Robbie Jr., here to make history with Daddy, it's a special thing. It's an incredible time. And I want to also thank the, the great speakers, Rob Skiba, Mark Sargent, Patricia Steer, Emmanuel Laconga, Jaron Campanella, Bob Nodell, and Matt Long. Absolutely incredible. As I get to know you, you guys are integral, and I consider you not just friends, but incredibly decent people. You guys are really the core. Your hearts are in the right place, and you're genuine and true. And honestly, you're looking at a really good amount of people that are representing that they want the best for the community and they're trying their hardest. And again, we can't always do the right thing all the time and we come under criticism and some days we wake up and we're hated and some days we wake up and we're loved. But again, we go through a lot, but honestly, I know these guys and we are all trying to be true and really do this right. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Conference director, John Gabrielson. John, thank you so much. I mean, you... <laughs> You kicked it off in Raleigh, North Carolina, when we made history, and you were such an integral part, and you really helped make things really happen. And I mean, you even went beyond with Canada, and it even went even smoother. And I'm so thankful that you're helping me, knowing that you've done some incredible conferences, and it's incredible how the first time I got to meet you, you invited me to your conference to speak. And now here you are directing my conferences, and buddy, I couldn't do it without you, so thank you. Obviously, our Masters of Ceremony, Rick Hummer. Honestly, with Rick Hummer, I've got to know on such a deep level, and I can tell you one thing. Rick has a heart of gold. When I opened up and I said that he's intelligent, very funny, and he has a heart of gold, it is absolutely true. He will do anything for someone to help them out. He will talk to strangers. He is a true man of God, and it's a pleasure to be a friend and honestly know you because you are a good, good person, man, and it's, it's amazing to see. All of the wonderful volunteers, obviously, thank you so much. It is just an amazing thing to basically help company, have all this together, you know. And, uh, you know, especially the Jacksons family, as I said at the very beginning, the entire family from my church that we're attending here, they came to learn, they came to support, and it's a wonderful thing to know that we're in a supportive church, that even if they don't agree, 100%, you know, that, that it, it, to me, it's a very incredible thing. And while, you know, being geocentric, to me, I'm almost sometimes just as happy because I'll tell you, it's a huge paradigm shift and that's fighting the whole mainstream narrative. So thank you so much, Jacksons. I really, really, really appreciate, you know, how you've, you've taken us in. We found a family and we were encouraged to grow with you and your church. Uh, mm, let's go with the production crew. Thank you so much, Evolution Media doing the amazing production. I know there were a lot of things coming. There were a lot of things coming to you, uh, you know, last minute, and, and you, you worked through it, and while there were certain hiccups here and there, overall, I really thank you for being diligent and trying your best to make it happen and make it the best that it can be, especially when we're making history in Canada. So thank you. I want to thank, yes, thank you. I want to thank West Edmonton Mall. It's an amazing thing, and I think a lot of people that have never been to Edmonton or ever seen a mall this big, I think it was an eye-opening experience. And for me, people sometimes say, well, why'd you choose West Edmonton Mall? There's many reasons, and I can go into them. But one of the, th one of the big reasons was that this invited not people that maybe weren't on the same page so that someone could attend the conference, but the others could go, like a family. You know, it gave it the ability to actually do two things at once, and I've heard from many people that they were able to do that. Can I say something? Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, you know, last but not least, all of you. Absolutely. And I've said this to a few of you, but I'm saying this wouldn't happen without you. Absolutely. No, like seriously. All of you make this happen. 
And again, it is so incredibly important you understand that. When you say, oh, you know, what am I doing? You know, just doing this, you're doing something. Because again, together when you start networking and you meet other people in your city and stuff, and you start talking and you start strategizing and just developing relationships and networking, honestly, it gets easier, I'm telling you. But when you just don't know anyone or you haven't even met someone in real life, there's so many people that are online right now, and they'll be saying all sorts of things about this conference, and that's fine. But you know what the sad reality is? They're not going to be able to experience something like this. And I say to the people that are all the skeptics, come out and see what it would be like because I know that there's a lot of criticism sometimes and I'm saying it's important and community is incredibly important and what you're doing you're contributing and you're making it happen just like all of us it basically wouldn't happen if all these components were in place we wouldn't be here we wouldn't be making history and we are so thank you so much for making history in Canada with FE 2018 Canada it was an incredible time and uh, well actually wait wait a minute wait the, the, wait a minute, I think I had that. Well, oh, that's right. I had something else. That's right. How could I forget it, right? I always end my conferences with a bit of a surprise that very few people even know what's going on. I mean, when I was in Raleigh, when I ended it, I already had the tickets up for the next conference that was going to happen in Denver. And people were already excited. So, what could I have today? Let's, let's, let's just roll. Let's roll. <laughs> That's right, the largest cruise ship in the world. The first flat earth cruise. Because hey, hey, if there's anything we know, water's flat. And we're gonna have a great time sailing on a seven day cruise, leaving Florida, going to St. Thomas, St. Kitts, and to the Bahamas, September 2019, a lot of time. And I don't know if many people have cruised, but I'll tell you, when I did my destination wedding with my wife, as I started talking to people and we started inviting people to it, when they realized actually how cheap it was, they were like, yeah, okay, we'll come. And one, you know, we thought we'd be a few people. And our wedding party, I think, was about 12 at the end of it. And they were just random people. And they're like, yeah, the cruise itself is all-inclusive. And I'm sure you've heard stories, but it is absolutely an incredible experience. It's all-inclusive, all of your meals, your, your rooms, um, all your entertainment is all included and I think it works out to about hundred and twenty dollars a night so if you actually if you actually work it out a cruise will probably work out to being cheaper than traveling to a conference now just because the cruise is going on this is not much just an event this is going to be also a vacation so if you ever plan a vacation you get two in one with this one big time because the conference will be the first two days when we're on sea but then we'll be de we'll be in destinations as we continue on the journey it's going to be an incredible time, the first flat earth cruise on the largest cruise ship in the world. And I'll tell you, flat earth is going to take it by storm. Because I always say, it's like, what can we do when we know that the earth is flat, but when we know water always finds its level, and we're going to go to the next level on the cruise ship next year. Thank you.
All right. Um, we have to kind of get out of everybody's way. We're going to move over to um, the other room, but before you go, you got one last chance to get. There's some items left in there. Some of it's already sold out, but there's still some stuff there. Uh, T-shirts, the coins, the artwork, it's all there. But if you're part of the VIP dinner, it starts at 6 o'clock, and it's in conference room number 5. Conference room number 5 is where we'll be eating. So get up, stretch your legs. Uh, just so you know, I don't know if they uh, announced this earlier, the big alarm that was going off, the bells going off, it was from the fires. It was from the fires, and it was people left their windows open in their hotel rooms. So every time they got one fire alarm shut off, another one was going off, and another one was going off. So I felt bad. The, uh, the fire department, I think they lost a lot of weight, and they didn't even fight a fire tonight. So they were running everywhere looking for this, where's the alarm? So... Anyway, thank the staff, because they were, they were busting their butts. I saw it myself. So thank you. We'll see you at dinner. And again, thanks to the production crew. You guys are awesome. But we need to work on that, that name. We're going to put an R in front of there. <laughs>